Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Angela Constance on the historic child abuse inquiry. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her speech and there should be therefore no interventions or interruptions. I call Angela Constance. Cabinet Secretary, around 10 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. On becoming the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, I gave a commitment to establish an independent inquiry into historical abuse of children in institutional care uh, with full statutory powers to compel witnesses uh, and demand evidence. On 17 December last year, I announced to this Parliament that we would consult with survivors and others on the inquiry's remit and the appointment of a chair. And we took a careful, consultative approach to try to build consensus and I can today report to Parliament uh, on the outcomes of that work. Presiding officer, it is important to emphasise that no inquiry can right the wrongs of the past, uh, but that is not a reason to fail to act. And also, presiding officer, we have listened to the views of survivors on the shape and the scope uh, of the inquiry. And I am grateful to those who have given of their time and knowledge uh, but I know that many have yet to come forward and I do hope sincerely that survivors will use this opportunity to tell of their experiences and testify to the inquiry. This inquiry will aim to shine a light in the dark corners of the past to shape how we respond in the present uh, and guide how we go forward in the future. And we need to learn all we can to ensure that no institution becomes a hiding place for those who abuse positions of trust to prey on our children. And we want to make Scotland the best place for all of our children to grow up. Children and young people must grow up feeling cared for, nurtured and loved, as well as being protected from harm, abuse and neglect. And we have a particular commitment to our most vulnerable young people, those of whose care and protection the state is directly responsible for. And accordingly, we will listen carefully to the inquiry's eventual recommendations and make whatever changes may be necessary to policy, practice or legislation. Reaching a decision on the scope of the inquiry has been challenging, given the range of views even amongst survivors. The remit cannot be so wide that survivors lose hope of the inquiry ever reaching clear and specific conclusions. And I am mindful of the urgency of this last issue, given the age and the health of some survivors. The inquiry will examine any instance where a child was abused in care, including residential care, children's homes, secure care, borstals and young offender institutions, and also those placed in foster care. In care will also carry a broader interpretation to include allegations affected boarding out children, child migrant schemes, school hostels and healthcare establishments providing long-term care for children. Independent boarding schools are also included and while parents were responsible for the placement of their children in these institutions, the state also has a responsibility to ensure a standard of care. And the starting date for the inquiry scope will simply be within living memory. The inquiry's chair will determine the exact end date, but it will be no later than the 17th of December 2014. And this timeline goes further than originally envisaged and has been informed by the views of survivors and others. And the inquiry will be asked to report to ministers within four years of the date of commencement to be no later than the 1st of October. And I expect it to take a human rights based approach to be inquisitorial rather than adversarial, enabling people with little experience of legal processes to engage with it. And crucially, the inquiry will also examine the ongoing effects of abuse on survivors and their families to improve our understanding of the issues that they face to help us improve support for them now and in the future. Taking all of this into account, the inquiry needs a chair who can rise to these challenges while gaining and maintaining the confidence of survivors. And I am pleased to announce Susan O'Brien QC will chair the inquiry. 
Ms O'Brien is an experienced advocate in civil litigation, including issues pertinent to this inquiry, and has a knowledge and expertise in human rights. And crucially, she also chaired the Caleb Ness inquiry in Edinburgh in 2003. And I am very grateful to her for agreeing to take on this very significant task. Of course, the inquiry forms a significant part of the Scottish Government's wider response to the Scottish Human Rights Commission Interaction Plan. As significant as this will be, it does not stand alone in demonstrating our commitment to survivors of abuse. Survivors have told me about childhoods lost as a result of abuse. And their experiences have impacted adversely on their adult lives also. Restoring what has been lost is vital. Scotland is one of only a few countries to develop and implement a dedicated support strategy for survivors of historic abuse in any setting. For 10 years, Survivor Scotland has delivered services many survivors describe as their lifeline. We now intend to build on this and to do more. And so, Presiding Officer, I am announcing today that we will set up a dedicated support fund for survivors of abuse placed in care by the state. This will enable survivors to identify their own personal goals and access the right support to achieve them. Work on this will begin immediately with £13.5 million allocated over the next five years to develop a dedicated in-care support service. I am also announcing an additional £1 million to enhance the support available to all who have been abused, whether in care or not, through the Survivor Scotland uh, Development Fund. Through the interaction process, many of those abused in care as children called for the right to seek reparation. And this would involve removing the time bar, which requires a civil case for compensation to be brought to court within the three-year limitation period. At the heart of this issue is the reality of childhood abuse. It can take decades for a survivor to have the strength to challenge their abuser in court. And having listened to survivors and examined the legal position carefully, I can announce that this Scottish Government intends to lift the three-year time bar on civil action in cases of historical childhood abuse since September 1964. We will consult on how best to do this in the summer. And to further demonstrate our commitment to this issue, we will also produce a draft bill by the end of this parliamentary session. With regards to cases before September 1964, I must be clear that there are considerable challenges regarding human rights. We will, of course, continue to listen to views on what, if anything, can be done to remove barriers pre-1964. Presiding Officer, I believe I have set out today demonstrates that this is a dynamic process and that we are a Scottish Parliament that listens, hears and acts. And while we cannot undo the deeds of the past, we can acknowledge them, address their impact and learn how to do much better in the future to protect Scotland's most vulnerable children. And as a Parliament, we can and must give voice to those who have been silenced for too long. We can and must recognise the abuse they suffered as children and we can, we must and we will do everything we can to ensure that the same thing never ever happens again. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions after which we'll move on to the next item of business. Members who wish to ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary should press the request to speak button now. And I call Ian Gray. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for her statement and early sight uh, of it. We sincerely welcome today's statement. We very much want this inquiry to succeed, and we want to work with the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that happens. It must be a bright and unfettered light that we shine into this dark corner of our nation's recent past. And above all, the survivors of abuse must have total confidence that we will not flinch and will face that past without fear or favour. In 2008, the then Minister told this chamber that no further inquiries were required in Scotland and that the time bar must remain. So today's announcement 
is great and welcome progress indeed. But we have to recognise that it has taken a very long time. Central to survivors' confidence, of course, is the chair uh, of the inquiry, as we have seen all too clearly uh, in England. Survivors had the expectation of a High Court judge uh, to lead the inquiry. So uh, what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give us that she knows that Ms O'Brien's appointment is acceptable to survivors? And crucial, too, is the breadth of the inquiry. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to confirm, for the avoidance of doubt, that establishments run by religious institutions or religious orders are contained within the scope of the inquiry. Cabinet Secretary. Well, let me start by answering the last question that Mr Gray uh, posed uh, very directly, and the answer is yes. And I hope that that is uh, crystal clear. Can I also reassure Mr Gray that the voice of survivors has been absolutely central in this. Um, it is fair to say that there is a range of views uh, within the survivor community um, about a, a chair. Um, all of those views I have taken on board. Uh, there were many debates about whether the chair should be someone uh, within Scotland, out with Scotland, within the legal profession um, or not. And I am confident that we now have the right person to chair this inquiry. And perhaps it would be useful for me to, uh, presiding officer, share a bit more information uh, with regards to uh, Susan O'Brien, who has been in practice as a QC since 1998. She was a solicitor for six years uh, before she was called to the bar in 87. And she has represented abuse victims and took a test case on time bar in historic claims uh, to the House of Lords in 2008. And I know that she understands the issues that are so important to survivors. And I also know that she's a highly, highly competent uh, woman. She was the legal chair of the panel of three which investigated the death of a baby which produced the Caleb Ness report in 2003. This was a highly significant report, um, not just for social work services, but for health services right across Scotland. I was a social worker uh, at that time that that report uh, made its recommendations and I know the impact that that report um, had on the social work profession and other uh, establishments and of course that report led to significant changes uh, here uh, in the city of Edinburgh. And Ms O'Brien uh, in the 90s, 1980s uh, was also on the steering committee which set up the Scottish Child Law uh, Centre. So I am confident, presiding officer, that we have struck the right balance between someone who has the necessary legal skills and experience, but also, crucially, understands, first and foremost, uh, the needs uh, of survivors. And all I can say to Mr Gray with regards to the passage of time, I am very painfully aware that it was Chris Daly who first brought the petition to this parliament a way back in 2002. And I think if we are to move forward together, united in this chamber, we all have to reflect on the passage of time and how long it has taken to get to this point. I know there's a wealth of work that has taken place since the establishment of this parliament. And we can demonstrate that we collectively are a parliament that listens and acts. But we all have to do so much more. And in that spirit of cooperation, I welcome Mr Gray's words that we shouldn't flinch without fear or favour and that applies to us all as we look to the future and move on together. Ms Smith. Uh, thank you and could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight of the statement. Can, can I associate uh, our uh, very strong recommendations uh, with the uh, Scottish Government and the way that it has handled this situation. It's obviously very sensitive indeed, and I think it is absolutely imperative that this Parliament is united in the way that we move forward. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you said uh, very carefully at the uh, start of your remarks that the scope of the inquiry has been shaped by the consultation of survivors, and I think that is something that uh, is extremely important, as is the £13.5 million support fund. Would it be possible to have a little bit more in terms of the detail as to how uh, that support fund uh, might work? 
because I think, uh, as I say, the, these survivors, very brave survivors, need that support. But I, additionally, I think there's a duty to ensure uh, that we support and protect those who are currently working in some of the institutions that may at some stage be under investigation. So if it's possible, Cabinet Secretary gives that. And secondly, could I just ask whether the principles of the investigation will actually underpin uh, the uh, structure of the report in the same way that will be the case for the UK investigation, because obviously uh, there will be situations where they have uh, a cross-border implication. Cabinet Secretary. Um, as announced in the, the statement, presiding officer, there is an additional £13.5 uh, million pounds, uh, to be invested over a, a five-year period, that's 2015 to 20. Uh, £1.5 million pounds will be available for, for this financial year, thereafter um, th £3 million pounds, uh, a year rolling uh, forward. And there's the, the million pounds uh, for uh, survivor support for, for all survivors. Um, and the the, the rationale between, for this investment is to ensure that survivors get a, a personalised service, um, a, that they get support that is based on their needs for as long as they need. Um, and I do expect the, the InCare Survivor Support Fund uh, and the Enhanced Support for All Survivors of Abuse to be operational uh, this year. We will work very closely uh, with survivors to consult and listen to them as we go through the, the procurement and tendering um, for services. But this is about having a one-stop shop for survivors where they can access uh, practical support, whether it's employment, uh, education, uh, bus fares to, to services, or whether it's about accessing uh, that more specialist support uh, that people need, uh, particularly when they've experienced great uh, trauma in their, in their life. So it's designed to be bespoke and personal to the needs um, of each uh, survivor. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the principles that uh, underpin uh, the inquiry, um, we have indeed looked very closely at developments with the, the UK uh, inquiry. And I think you know, the point uh, that Ms Smith touched on, it is important that we don't look at inquiries um, in isolation. While we are jurisdictions and the, the scope and remit of the inquiry in Scotland uh, is different uh, from that in the one in England. Um, but my officials um, are very grateful to you know, officials in the Home Office and south of the border uh, for that sharing of knowledge uh, and experience. And while the inquiry south of the border has had its issues um, and we've sought to learn from that, there are also uh, things about the inquiry south of the border that we would uh, seek to learn from more positively. Um, for example, they are setting up a reference group uh, for survivors to keep them informed of progress as the uh, inquiry um, proceeds. And they have also you know, set up a, an expert panel, small selective expert panel, uh, to uh, support uh, the chair. And there will, of course, have to be very appropriate protocols uh, between um, in inquiries because no one wants to see um, overlap. Um, and in terms of the, th the third uh, point raised by, by Ms. Ms. Smith, um, I think it's important to recognise that um, the vast, vast majority of people who work to support um, our vulnerable children do uh, a grand job. Um, and anyone who is you know, designated as a, a core participant, um, the inquiry will have to think about how all of those core participants um, are treated fairly uh, and supported um, accordingly. And I know um, that officials, my officials, have certainly been in touch with agencies in terms of NHS uh, and, and, and local authorities, but I'm happy to supply further information. Thank you, Rod Campbell, for by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, as you are aware, in September 1984, the law on prescription was amended so that the long stop 20 year prescription period was removed from cases such as these. But that change was not retrospective. That means that any claims which were prescribed before September 1964 were not revived, and to seek to revive them now would raise considerable legal issues. Is there anything further you can tell the Chamber about this issue? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, as uh, Mr Campbell will be aware from his um, own professional background, this area is technical and complex, and I'll just take a minute to uh, run through it for, for the parliamentary record. As we know, the Prescription and Limitations Act 1984 applied a 20-year prescription period uh, to obligations to make representation in respect of personal injuries. 
So the 1984 Act came into force on the 26th of September 84, and accordingly cases where the right of action had arisen prior to the 26th of September 1964 were not revived under the law as it presently stands. And as it presently stands, it's not possible to bring before a court any child abuse case where the relevant abuse all took place prior uh, to that date. And, you know, the government does acknowledge the difficulties that have been expressed by the Scottish Law Commission and others, um, and the difficulties that uh, Mr Campbell touched upon uh, that might arise um, should attempts be made to revive personal injury claims that were extinguished by the negative prescription through the legislation on uh, the 26th of September 1984. Um, and there are obvious concerns about applying liability uh, retrospectively to someone for events in the past where they are currently not liable for those events and how that may contravene the person's human rights and specifically um, Article 1 uh, of the First Protocol of the European Convention of, of Human Rights. And I apologise that that is a very um, technical um, legal um, explanation, but I do want to emphasise, presiding officer, that I gave a commitment personally to survivors that we would be very clear about our position on time bar as a government when we came back to this chamber. And what I've announced today is a significant step forward. It is a significant movement uh, where we have the intention uh, to you know, lift uh, the time bar um, in terms of cases post-64. We will have to consult carefully on how we do that. Um, but there are real legal issues in terms of pre-1964 but nonetheless, we will have that dialogue with all partners and particularly in terms of survivors because we are in the business of opening doors, not closing doors, and to find solutions. Neil Bibby, followed by Christina McKelvey. I join members in paying tribute to the commitment and tenacity of survivors throughout this long process, some of whom are in the public gallery this afternoon. The Cabinet Secretary said that she hopes that survivors will use the opportunity to testify to the inquiry and tell of their experiences. She will be aware that a number of survivors will need financial, uh, practical and legal support to do this. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary if survivors as part of the uh, Survivor Support Fund will be offered legal aid and financial support, including expenses, uh, in order to allow them to participate fully in the inquiry? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I mean, let me reassure Mr Bibby that in terms of the issues um, in and around legal aid, that all the usual um, processes um, apply and you know, that those processes that apply to everybody uh, will also uh, apply to uh, survivors um, you know, seeking um, assistance. Um, what I try to do in the, in the lead up to establishing uh, this inquiry is to be as flexible as possible and when uh, survivors have approached the government in terms of needing support for example to participate in the consultation process um, we have showed willing um, and responded positively uh, to requests uh, in a, a pragmatic uh, manner. In terms of how uh, survivors are supported pragmatically to participate in the inquiry. Uh, that is obviously a matter uh, for the chair of the inquiry and for the inquiry um, itself. But if I can reassure the member that we are acutely aware um, of the needs of survivor and that you know, we need to have a very supportive uh, process. Christina McKelvey, followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Can I welcome the very significant advance made in this cause by the Cabinet Secretary today. Uh, I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary, I'm keen to know how allegations involving clear criminal wrongdoing will be dealt with, what measures will be put in place to ensure that disclosures made in the inquiry will be channelled to the appropriate criminal justice agencies. And on that basis, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary to provide the assurance that consideration be given to an examination of facts to enable survivors to have their day in court, to tell their story, and a key issue for them all is to be believed and have trust in the system. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely, I concur with uh, Ms. Ms. McKelvey's views and her uh, sentiments that she's expressed. Um, the inquiry is being set up in such a way as to 
give survivors every opportunity to tell what has happened to them and they can be absolutely assured that they will be uh, believed. And while the, the detail of, of the operation is, of course, a matter for the inquiry itself, um, we have, in getting to this stage, worked very closely uh, with the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service, Police Scotland, to ensure that where testimony uh, suggests that a criminal investigation is appropriate, that that can uh, indeed uh, be undertaken. The inquiry um, is not there to establish um, guilt or innocence in a, a civil or uh, criminal way. Um, it is there to uh, establish uh, facts, uh, have a national record uh, and enable us to uh, allow voices to be heard that have previously not been heard and so that as a government uh, and a country uh, that we can learn uh, from past failures. Liam McArthur, followed by Riley Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of our statement and very much welcome the contents of it, particularly the intention to lift the time bar, notwithstanding the inherent difficulties I think she very fairly uh, articulated. Uh, she will be aware that one of the demands of survivors has been around um, the access to third party advocates. Uh, she wrote to my colleague Alice McInnes earlier this year, suggesting it may be that advocates could be appointed by the Chair of the Inquiry uh, to give uh, testimony on, uh, on behalf of survivors. Um, can she say whether or not that is part of a personalised service or whether or not advocates, third party advocates chosen by survivors themselves may be more appropriate to support? And in terms of the, the four year timetable, I think that's an entirely reasonable time frame for completing an inquiry of this complex and sensitive nature. But in terms of learning lessons for the future, um, what uh, reassurances can she give that lessons will be learnt now and that will she commit uh, to providing an update to Parliament on steps being taken to address concerns raised about current child protection arrangements in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, of course, because while the inquiry proceeds uh, with its business, um, the business of government, uh, local and national government, um, in terms of our responsibilities to protect children in Scotland and here and now, uh, that continues. Uh, and of course, uh, this government has to be scrutinised uh, for our responsibilities uh, in this uh, area. Uh, so I am absolutely confident that whether it's myself or Fiona MacLeod uh, or Aileen Campbell, uh, when she returns from maternity leave, that um, I would anticipate and expect uh, that that to be a, a a, a firm uh, feature of our um, involvement and accountability uh, to, to Parliament. Um, the position, as I wrote to uh, Ms McInnes with regards to access to third party advocates, um, is, is the same, it's, it's unchanged and uh, of course advocates can be used uh, by survivors in a way that is about their personal support uh, and the chair will be able to uh, you know, come to a view uh, about the role of advocates in, in, in the inquiry uh, process um, and, and I think that's uh, quite clear, although some of the matters are indeed for the chair uh, and the, the inquiry. Wally Coffey, followed by Graeme Pearson. Thank you. Can I remind the Cabinet Secretary that the handling of the UK inquiry into historical child abuse and the distress caused by that has been fairly well documented. Could she outline how she will ensure that this inquiry won't make the same mistakes? Cabinet Secretary. Um, what I would say to Mr Coffey, and it's a, a part of reiteration to my answer to uh, Ms uh, Smith, um, this is a, a, a difficult uh, process. Uh, we, of course, have looked to other jurisdictions, whether it's the inquiry in England uh, or the one in Northern Ireland or the one in, in Jersey, to learn from their experiences both uh, positively and negatively. We have worked very, very hard uh, with survivors um, and had an extensive consultation uh, period with different types of consultation opportunities to do our utmost to ensure that this inquiry gets off uh, to uh, the best start. And as I said to uh, Ms Smith, while the English inquiry has certainly not been without its difficulties, there are positives that we can learn from that inquiry also. Graham Pearson, followed by Michael Russell. Presiding officer, I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of, of her statement. Uh, Thirteen months ago, I led a members' debate on this issue and called on the then Cabinet Secretary to institute a public inquiry. It was denied. Survivors, some in the public gallery today, have waited for eight years for the SNP Government to make today's announcement. During that time, and in recent months, uh, survivors have died. Can the Cabinet Secretary, knowing the trauma, faced by survivors, 
confirm now some fresh details of the psychological support that will be available to survivors from today? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can, can I say to uh, Mr Pearce that I gave a number of very personal commitments to survivors and one of those commitments um, that despite being a politician, despite being a political animal, that irrespective of what anybody in this chamber said to me, I just wasn't going to rise to it. And as I said to your uh, colleague, uh, Mr Gray, the petition, the first petition calling for an inquiry was in 2002. I think we can all reflect uh, on our past involvement on this. And as I often say to Mr Gray and other exchanges regarding education, I'm actually not that interested in the past. What I'm interested is in the here and now and how we move forward in the future to do a far better job of protecting all of Scotland's children. And I hope that that is met with the, the spirit that it is intended to. And I would hope that Mr Pearson would recognise that there's a substantial announcement being made today in terms of movement and addressing time bar issues, but also in terms of a very significant investment in survivor support services, which is about dealing with the, the practical issues, but also helping people to get access uh, to services with regards to trauma. <laughs> Can I say to members that this statement is of great importance to people both in and outside this chamber, um, and it's obviously very, very sensitive. Um, I've got a duty to protect the next debate as far as possible, um, but I intend to allow uh, this to continue um, for as long as necessary, um, recognising the importance of it um, to people outside. There will be an impact on the debate that comes afterwards. So can I ask members, if you are asking questions, to try and keep them as brief as possible. I am not going to curtail the questions. I intend to make sure that everybody who wants to ask will ask. Um, but, you know, can I ask you to help me to protect as much as possible um, the next debate, which is important to the Parliament? So can I call on Michael Russell, followed by Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I very warmly welcome the announcement from the Cabinet Secretary? As the Cabinet Secretary knows, one of the most important contributions in getting to this point was the work done by the Scottish Human Rights Commission with others in the interaction process, a, a process that enables reconciliation and dialogue. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that that approach continues to underpin the Scottish Government's uh, attitude to this issue. So that as a society, we not only call to account those who committed these dreadful crimes, but that as a society, we can also find ways of healing the hurt so that survivors can anticipate a time in which they not only survive, but they actually go on and flourish. Cabinet Secretary. Trade Officer, Mr Russell is right to uh, point out that the interaction process has played an absolutely crucial role in getting us to where we are today. And I'm extremely grateful to um, everyone who has taken part uh, in that process, not least uh, the central role that survivors themselves um, have had uh, to play. And I would also like to uh, pay tribute to my friend and colleague, Mr Russell, for his role in getting us to where we are today as well. It should be important to emphasise that the Scottish Human Rights Commission um, and you know, the National Action Plan and the survivors' engagement, that's not a process which the government controls. Um, but if survivors uh, and the Scottish Human Rights Commission um, you know, wish to, to get together to continue that collaborative process, um, this government will be more than happy to participate uh, fully uh, and in good spirit. Alex Ferguson, followed by Jackie Bailey. Officer. Um, I, I would take issue with one part of the Cabinet Secretary's statement. She said, survivors have told me about childhoods lost as a result of abuse. Restoring what has been lost is vital. With huge respect, I don't think you can restore a lost childhood. But if we get this process right, we can go a huge way towards bringing closure to the victims of childhood abuse. And to that end, can I enormously welcome, as others have done, the decision to look at ending the time bar 
even uh, with the constraints of going back to, to 1964. I asked about this last December, and, and the Cabinet Secretary very cleverly passed the buck to her colleague Paul Wheelhouse. Um, but can I just ask in that regard, will she, or indeed he, undertake to keep Parliament fully updated on the Government's progress towards a bill, uh, and also on the proper legal safeguards that will require to remain in place during that process? Cabinet Secretary. Um, ab absolutely. And uh, Mr Ferguson, I did say um, at the start of my statement that we can undo the past and we can't put all wrongs to right, but that doesn't give us an excuse uh, not to act. And I am very conscious that Mr Ferguson said to me on the way out from the last statement I gave, he challenged me and said that I didn't actually answer his question. Um, to which I um, acknowledge that I didn't really answer his question um, at that point in time. Um, but I am pleased to be able to give <laughs> a far more definitive answer that this government is about opening doors and addressing this time bar issue. It is not easy. There are problems, particularly pre-1964, and that I most certainly was not going to demure from highlighting those uh, problems. The last thing I want to do is to lead people up the garden path only to dash their hopes. But we are in the business of opening doors and finding solutions. Uh, and of course, you know, whether it's myself or Mr Wheelhouse, and I have to say Mr Wheelhouse um, has had a lot of contact in listening to survivors with regards to this particular issue. We will, of course, uh, relish the prospect of keeping Parliament informed because we will be looking uh, to benefit from the brains of the brightest and the best in this Parliament. We have some thorny issues uh, to solve and I will be looking forward to Mr Ferguson's contribution to that. Jack Bailey followed by Gil Patterson. I very much welcome the lifting of the time bar and know that it will help my constituents too and also welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement of a support fund. The Cabinet Secretary will of course be aware that in Ireland the Government made an interim payment of €10,000 to every survivor which was in addition to a support fund. I think they took that approach because and she'll recognise that in the last six weeks there have been a number of deaths of survivors so on that basis will she consider making interim payments to survivors as they did in Ireland. Cabinet Secretary. Can I uh, say to Ms Bailey that in terms of support and access to justice, that has been very much at the basis of the investment we're making in the Survivor Support Fund and, of course, uh, our steps uh, to remove uh, time bar. Um, this is not the end of a process. I'm not going to stand here and try and second guess what all the solutions are other than to say that we are still on a journey. I'm aware of interim payments uh, on an ex gratia basis being paid by some uh, local authorities. Uh, I am looking very closely at other experiences uh, in other uh, jurisdictions. And while we don't have all the solutions right here and now, we're still on that journey and we're in the business of finding solutions. Bill Patterson, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Can I thank uh, the presiding officer for allowing this, uh, these questions to be put uh, at this time? Uh, and can I also welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary is reporting to Parliament now uh, what is uh, a matter that is very complex, as members have already highlighted. Could the Cabinet Secretary expand on why she has used the definition of in-care uh, uh, that she has outlined in her statement? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, the definition of uh, in care presiding officer for the purpose of uh, this inquiry uh, means a child that is in the care of a person or organisation uh, other than the child's natural or adoptive parents or other family members. And as I set out in my statement, we have gone much further than originally envisaged uh, with the definition of in care to bring a potentially much wider group of people uh, into the ambit of the inquiry. And I've done that for, for, for two reasons. Firstly, I have sought to strike a balance between the need for the inquiry to investigate those issues which survivors have said are most important to them, uh, with the need for the inquiry to report on systemic issues and within a, a reasonable uh, timescale. But secondly, President Officer, we have one opportunity to do this, um, and we do indeed want to uh, shine a light in the dark corners uh, of our past to shape how we respond and how we uh, go forward in the future. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Cara Hilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement and the allocation of funding, particularly for the national strategy 
and uh, Survivor Development Fund. I also acknowledge and very much welcome the wide definition of in care. However, given the vast majority of childhood and sexual abuse happens in the community and in a family setting, can she confirm that the Survivor Development Fund's core funding will continue annually? And can she also confirm that this is an additional one million for the Survive, Survivor Development Fund? And if so, over what time scale? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, can I say to uh, Margaret Mitchell, I'm acutely aware that the majority of abuse does indeed uh, occur uh, within the family or uh, within the community. Uh, the purpose of this inquiry was to look at the systemic failures uh, where the state or the apparatus of the state had made decisions uh, that involved children being looked after um, elsewhere. And we have, uh, as she rightly welcomed, uh, you know, ha had a broad definition of what um, in care means. Uh, yes, in terms of the uh, survivor uh, support fund, I think it's funded uh, annually on a basis of £800,000. And this um, million pounds is indeed additional. Cara Hilton, followed by John Wilson. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement today and in particular the dedicated support fund that's been announced. Um, can I ask what is the eligibility for survivors of child abuse suffered here in Scotland who are now living elsewhere, either in another part of the UK or indeed abroad? Will they be able to access the support fund too? Cabinet Secretary. What we will do between now and uh, autumn this year is that we will work very closely um, with survivors um, about the, the criteria uh, for, for the funding. I don't have a direct answer uh, for that uh, question, but it is something that we will work closely uh, with survivors on, and I'll ensure that Ms Hilton's kept up to date on that very pertinent point. John Wilson, and then finally Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary in terms of the inquiry and the timescale, is she confident that the inquiry can be delivered within the four-year timescale that she set out and whether or not there has been a budget set aside for this inquiry to take place, including financial support for the survivors and their advocates? Cabinet Secretary. Mr Wilson uh, asks uh, a fair question. Um, in setting the, the timescale for the inquiry, we have sought to strike a balance. Uh, this is probably Scotland's biggest uh, public inquiry. Um, it is a massive uh, undertaking. That's why we have thought very carefully about who to appoint to chair this inquiry. It does need someone with exceptional uh, management and quite pragmatic skills, as well as legal knowledge, and you know, someone that is acutely aware and attuned uh, to the needs and views um, of uh, survivors. But I'm also conscious that you know, time stands still for no one and for many survivors who are elderly or in poor health, that everybody wants to see uh, some clear recommendations and the, the fruit of our labours uh, come to uh, fruition over this very uh, significant and, and difficult matter. Um, so I am confident that we have struck the balance right. I'm not saying it will be easy uh, to do the work in, in the time scale. Um, and, you know, the budget... Um, you know, will be there, it will be supported uh, appropriately. Um, it's um, not an insignificant undertaking, as Mr Swinney uh, will be um, aware of. But, you know, if we want justice to be done, that will indeed uh, cost money and not an insignificant amount of money. Thank you. Finally, Malcolm Chisholm. I congratulate the Cabinet Secretary. Welcome her statement and her great personal commitment on this issue. I've already written to her on behalf of a constituent, and I know he'll be asking uh, whether uh, he can be guaranteed that his terrible uh, suffering uh, will be listened to. Can she guarantee that all those affected will be listened to under the arrangements that she has outlined? Yes, we are work, work, working very hard, presiding officer, um, to be alert to the needs of individual survivors. Um, many survivors will want to uh, formally give evidence or give their testimony to an inquiry. Um, other survivors will wish to perhaps do that through third parties uh, or in writing. Um, and while the, the role of the National Confidential Forum is very separate from the inquiry, they've got two very separate uh, legal uh, basis for, for their establishment, um, you know, there will have to be you know, a, a protocol and a connectivity uh, 
be between, be between the two. But the purpose of this inquiry uh, is indeed for people to be listened to and for those voices uh, to be heard. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Cabinet Secretary. We are now moving on to the debate on motion number 13285 in the name of John Swinney on the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill. Um, the runover from the statement will have some impact on the debate that follows. Uh, I anticipate that the open speakers will now have four minutes. I would appreciate very much... The open debate speakers will have four minutes. The opening speakers um, will have uh, their usual allocation. But it would be extremely helpful if you could shave any time off it. Um, it would help the debate management thereafter. Um, can I call on John Swinney to speak to me of the motion? You've got a maximum of 30 minutes, Mr Swinney. Presiding officer, I, I intend to restrict my opening remarks to help out as you've requested as... I'm sure Parliament appreciates enormously the decision that you made in that statement. Um, President Officer, I, I'm delighted to open this debate on the principles of the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill and would like to express my thanks to the Devolution of Further Powers Committee for the detailed scrutiny they have given to the Bill and to those who have contributed to the uh, consultation process that has surrounded this issue. Um, the issue of providing um, eligibility to vote for 16 and 17 year olds was taken forward in the independence referendum bill. Um, when the, in the independence referendum process, uh, it was judged by everybody in the aftermath of the referendum to have been a successful initiative which enabled young people to participate fully, fully in the settling of the future of our country. And uh, we therefore, on the basis of the success of that in initiative, uh, propose the extension of eligibility to vote to 16 and 17 year olds uh, for local authority and Scottish Parliament elections. The legislation in the, that is before Parliament today lowers the voting age to 16 for Scottish Parliament and local government elections and any other elections that adopt the local government franchise. It provides for modification to electoral registration forms to capture the details of all those eligible to register. It makes provision for how young people in particular situations are to be dealt with within existing electoral registration systems and sets out specific protections to be placed on any data collected on electors aged uh, under 16. Let me now turn convener, uh, commit, President Officer, to the recommendations the committee has made and to set out the Scottish Government's proposals for how we will take them forward. Firstly, I want to deal with the issue of political literacy, education and discussion of election issues in schools and colleges. The committee noted that they had heard evidence of inconsistency in approach across local authorities during the referendum. In the report on the arrangements for the referendum, they recommended that Education Scotland, the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, the Electoral Commission and others should consider how rules within schools during the pre-election period should be applied to ensure that young voters are able to discuss the issue freely in school, in particular through discussions with teaching staff. In their Stage 1 report, the Committee have recommended that Education Scotland review their guidance to bring more clarity about the type of activities that may be considered to be best practice in schools, particularly during pre-election periods. As I said in evidence to the Committee, there is existing guidance on political literacy education. I think the guidance takes the right approach. It respects teachers' professional discretion to determine what is taught in the classroom, whilst encouraging schools and teachers to enable young people to develop their political literacy skills through a variety of engaging activities. And indeed, this point was made to me very strongly by a group of young people I met this morning um, under the auspices of the Young Scot organisation, who were raising with me the importance of uh, access to quality and objective information within the school estate which would enable young people to formulate their views and I was grateful to them for the advice and the contribution they made this morning. I'm pleased to say that Education Scotland are currently reviewing and updating their suite of political literacy educational resources working with a wide range of stakeholders including young people and youth groups and this work is, ready, is due to be ready in September. I agree with the committee that some further guidance to bring clarity about the types of activities that might be undertaken in schools during pre-election periods would be helpful. 
I encourage all those organisations with an interest to work together to consider how the current guidance could be developed to further support schools and colleges to engage with elections issues with confidence. It will be important for school and college leaders, teachers, parents and most importantly young people themselves to be involved in this process. It is crucial that the guidance continues to respect teachers' professional discretion and ensures impartiality and balance in the information that young people receive about elections. I'm sure that all those involved will want to ensure that all young people are given every opportunity to reach a fair and dispassionate understanding of political processes and of their own choices. Next, Presiding Officer, I want to turn to the issue of political donations and young voters. The committee noted that restrictions on the data that will be published about young voters may mean that political parties would have difficulty in identifying that a young voter is registered to vote and therefore an eligible donor under the terms of PEPERA. The committee considered potential solutions, including the possibility that a young person could seek written confirmation from the relevant electoral registration officer that they were registered. I believe that this is an approach that has considerable merit and the Scottish Government is considering the form of amendments that could be introduced at stage two to provide for this suggestion. Another issue that was raised was possible implications for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service of not showing attainment dates for 16 and 17 year olds on the public register. The Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service was concerned that this could affect their ability to identify those eligible for jury service where the qualifying age is 18. Again, I can offer a positive response in that the Scottish Government is planning to put forward an amendment at stage two to provide that the public register will include attainment dates for 16 and 17 year olds, which will address the issues of concern to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. No information on those aged under 16 will of course appear on any published version of the register. I now want to deal with the duties of local authorities towards looked after children. As I noted earlier, the bill includes a duty on local authorities to promote awareness and provide assistance to enable the registration of looked after children. Like the committee, I have some sympathy with organisations such as Celsus, who take the view that this should be extended to care leavers. In this respect, I have asked my officials to discuss with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities whether there is a proportionate and practical approach that could be of assistance while avoiding unreasonable burdens on local authorities. The committee also noted an issue raised by the Electoral Commission about the interpretation of the bill in terms of the registration deadline for young voters. The intention of the bill is that the registration deadline should be the same for young voters as for all other voters, that is 12 days before poll. Having reviewed the relevant section of the bill, the Scottish Government is satisfied that it does not result in a later registration deadline for young voters and that no amendment is needed. My officials are in discussions with the Electoral Commission on that basis and we will write to the committee on the outcome of those discussions. Finally, I'd like to touch on the issue of ensuring registration and electoral information is accessible to children with additional support needs. I do of course share the objectives of the committee and of organisations such as Children in Scotland that the registration and electoral process should engage and be accessible to children with additional support needs. While I do not at this stage believe there is a need to amend the bill, I am happy to support work to review relevant materials in this respect. Presiding officer, I'd like to conclude by thanking the Devolution for, for the Powers Committee for the thoughtful work they've done on the bill to date. There is clearly some way to go before the bill completes its passage, but I'm encouraged by the broad support it has received to date in Parliament and amongst key stakeholders. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the United Kingdom Government and the Electoral Commission for the assistance they have provided with a number of practical issues related to registration forms and the digital service, and not least, of course, the ability of us to embark on this legislation by virtue of the cooperation around the Section 30 order. Presiding officer, this bill builds on the outstanding success of the participation of 16 and 17 year olds in the referendum. It extends that opportunity to elections under the control of this parliament, giving younger people a stronger stake in our democracy. It is an opportunity young people grasped with energy and enthusiasm during the referendum, and I urge members to support the general principles of the bill. I therefore move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill. Mr Swinney, I am indebted to you. I now call on Bruce Crawford to speak to 
On behalf of the devolution for the Powers Committee, a maximum of nine minutes, Mr Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I will try to abide by your beginning to say to try to shorten this a bit. I welcome the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Devolution for the Powers Committee, which is the lead committee in consideration of the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill. I would like to start by thanking everyone who provided evidence to the committee during our scrutiny of this bill, whether this is during formal evidence sessions or through their online calls for evidence. In particular, can I also thank the clerks, specifically Heather Galway, who is the lead clerk involved in a lot of the work in, in this bill. I also like to thank all the members of the committee for their constructive approach to the bill and for our unanimous report. We received 17 responses from organisations such as the Electoral Commission, Young Scots, Scottish Youth Parliament and Children in Scotland. These and all others were welcome contributions. In addition to our written and oral evidence, the committee has tried to connect with as many young people as possible to hear their views and ensure that their voices were heard on this important issue. As part of wider Parliament days, we visited Leavenmouth and Fort William and met with over 216 and 17 year olds. The key finding from the committee's discussions with 16 and 17 year olds who voted the referendum was that pupils believed they had shown that they were fully capable of making informed decisions. As well as our call for evidence, we also produced an online survey that was completed by, one th by over 1,000 16 and 17 year olds. The results of the survey were very clear. Over 79% of respondents agreed that 16 and 17 year olds should be allowed to vote in future elections to the Scottish Parliament and local authorities. The survey also highlighted how politically engaged those 16 and 17 year olds had become since they being allowed to vote in the independence referendum. Since then, 26% of those responding to our survey said they joined a political campaign or taken part in a campaigning or political activities and a further 63% had found out about more about politics. I am delighted to say that all five political parties on the committee unanimously support the general principles of the bill. I can confirm that in evidence provided to the committee, we received no substantive objection to the main objectives of the bill, namely to reduce the voting age to 16 for the Scottish Parliament and local government elections. President Officer, I will now briefly go over some of the key issues the committee looked into um, before the, hopefully the bill receives approval at stage one. The first key issue is public awareness among young people and the right to vote and educational issues. The committee welcomes the work already undertaken by the Electoral Commission and their partners to raise public awareness among young people and their rights and processes for registration and voting. The committee did, however, receive strong oral evidence from numerous witnesses that highlighted the importance of schools as a forum for discussion for young people. One of the main problems highlighted by school pupils and youth organisations was a lack of consistency across schools and colleges in Scotland to political engagement. We heard in some schools there were many opportunities to discuss political issues in the run-up to the independence referendum, but in others, pupils were advised that they were unable to have organised discussions, especially during the latter stages of the campaign, which coincided naturally with the point that most young people became engaged. For example, one pupil I spoke to in Leavenmouth told me how she tried to arrange a debate between politicians of both sides of the yes and no campaigns, but was advised this was not allowed within the school. This was an issue that was highlighted on numerous occasions. It was not only frustrating to school pupils, but also confusing. In the light of this, the committee saw the need for national guidelines to reduce to ensure a level of consistency across local authorities when it comes to what, and is, what is and what is not permitted in schools by way of discussions on these matters. I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has recognised that uh, in his announcement today about further guidance going to be made available by Education Scotland in this regard. Um, we agreed with the, the comments of the Deputy First Minister when he came to committee that no aspect of the education system should prevent young people from reaching a fair and dispassionate understanding of the political processes and choices. Uh, so I am sure that what is announced today will help ensure that the relevant education authorities are now best supporting the discussion of election issues in schools and colleges across Scotland. President officer, the second key issue I want to raise is the data protection. It's a very important issue and inclusion of those under 16 in the electoral register brings with it matters of data and child protection has been really recognised by the Cabinet Secretary. The, the committee wanted to be sure that personal information held in the electoral register would only be available to electoral registration officers and their staff. 
The committee had evidence from the Deputy First Minister, the Electoral Commission and the Information Commissioner's Office on this issue. As a result, we are confident that the processes being put in place will ensure that information on younger voters will be safeguarded. And I am also pleased that the Deputy First Minister clarified that matter in regard to practical issues in regard to the selection of juries in Scotland in his opening contribution. One final key issue the committee highlighted in its report that may be brought up by other speakers today is whether young offenders should be allowed to vote. As currently drafted, the bill does not amend Section 3 of the Representation of the People's Act 1983. This could only be achieved by legislation enacted at Westminster. This means convicted persons in penal institutions, including those under 18, will not be able to vote in future Scottish Parliament elections under this bill. We received written evidence on this matter from the Law Society of Scotland and the Howard League Scotland. I would like to reiterate the Committee's view, as stated in our Stage 1 report, that whether a provision is within the legislative competence of the Parliament is solely a matter for the courts. But in the light of the presiding officer's comment, opinion on the legislative competence and the Deputy First Minister's response during our Committee proceedings, we are satisfied to, to proceed with scrutiny at this stage. In closing, presiding officer, I would like to highlight briefly the fact that although this bill will allow 16- and 17-year-olds to vote in elections for the Scottish Parliament, it does not allow them to vote in elections to Westminster, and it is my understanding they will not be allowed to vote in EU in EU in out referendum. Although it is strictly not an issue for this bill, to me personally, the somewhat sense of an irony that we have to pass a bill at stage one today, while elsewhere a bill is being published where the franchise will not be extended to 16- and 17-year-olds. President Officer, I am pleased and honoured to be able to recommend that to the Parliament to agree the bill tonight at stage one and take the next step, step, step in permitting young people in Scotland to continue with the democratic rights which we in this Parliament trust them with. Sometimes I think when we are going through our job in this Parliament we get so involved in the detail that we do not always recognise that we are making history. That is exactly what we will be doing this evening at five o'clock if we pass this bill at stage one and all of this Parliament agrees to the principles of 16- and 17-year-olds voting in the Scottish Parliament elections and local government elections in future. I thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Crawford. Can I now call on Jackie Bailey, Ms Bailey, nine minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate, and I intend to follow the example of the Cabinet Secretary and the convener in striving for brevity. Um, votes for 16- and 17-year-olds has been a long-standing ambition for many people across this chamber, and I'm very pleased that we are taking steps to extend the franchise, not only for Scottish Parliament elections, but also for local government elections, by-elections, and for elections to public bodies like Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park, which covers my constituency and, indeed, Bruce Crawford's constituency. To be honest, it is a bit of a no-brainer in policy terms on two counts. Firstly, just think back to the debate during the independence referendum, the energy, the interest, the sheer dynamism that 16- and 17-year-olds brought to the referendum debate shows exactly why they should be allowed to vote. Young people at schools across Dumbarton, the Vale of Leave and Helensburgh took part in debates in the classroom, at home with family and on Facebook and social media with friends. I often thought they were the most educated section of the electorate asking indeed the hardest, most searching questions. So it's only right that their voice is heard in the Scottish Parliament elections next year. Indeed, I believe that no debate about the future of our country should take place without the future of our country being involved. Secondly, you know, there is something to be said that if you are old enough to pay income tax, you are old enough to have a say in how it is spent. Can I turn to the committee report and thank the members and clerks for their effective scrutiny to get us to this stage one debate? There is little to disagree with in their recommendations, and I note that the Cabinet Secretary has, in the short time available to him, addressed many, if not all, of these in his opening statement. But let me touch on just one area that the committee highlighted in the interests of time. And that is how we register attainers. That is, those young people under the age of 16 that might appear on the register in advance of their birth date due to the timing of the election. For the referendum, there was a separate register of young voters. There will be no need to create that separate register for future elections. But there is a note of concern about making public, even in restricted circumstances, the details of any person under 16. The provision in the bill, which is helpful, is that there would be a prohibition on disclosure, except when the registers are supplied to candidates in advance of the election. 
These registers would therefore contain data on those under 16. From an election point of view, it's absolutely necessary for candidates and their teams to be able to contact all electors, but we need to assure ourselves that there are no concerns from child protection professionals. There are obvious sensitivities about making public any data in relation to under 16-year-olds. These sensitivities were considered first in public, um, in, sorry, the pilot elections to health boards, then in the referendum vote, and these proposals proposals differ slightly to both of those. So I, I know that a privacy impact assessment has been carried out. That is very useful. It is of benefit, though, to all of us if these provisions could be checked again with appropriate childcare professionals. I want to turn to consultation with young people. And can I commend the infographic from the Parliament that summarised the survey of 16 and 17-year-olds undertaken by the Devolution Committee? It was absolutely wonderful in the simplicity of the data it revealed. A staggering 85% thought it was right for 16 and 17 year olds to be able to vote in the referendum. I suspect 100% of us in here agree it was right. 44% thought they were well informed, 30% quite well informed, 80% watched at least one of the televised debates and 63% discussed the referendum online. This and all the other statistics highlighted by Bruce Crawford showed that young people were very engaged during the entire process. But I want to share with the Chamber the views of two young local constituents who are active in my local community. One is Stephanie Thomas, soon to be the MSYP for Helensburgh and Lomond, and the other is Alex Robertson, who will be taking up her post as MSYP for Dumbarton and the Vale of Leven in the summer. Members may recall that whilst MSYPs are probably the youngest democratic voice in Scottish politics, the Scottish Youth Parliament is actually older than the Scottish Parliament itself by one day. It opened one day before MSPs met for the first time in 1999. But here's what Stephanie had to say. I definitely think it would be a good idea to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote. It will get them more involved in politics, let them make choices on things that affect them. With the education that you gain now, you know how to vote and also how the voting systems work. But you know, by the time you turn 18, you've then forgotten most of the stuff you have learnt. Alex told me, I feel as a 16-year-old myself that having a say in my future is a very important thing. At 16, a young person is allowed by law to make many complex decisions, such as getting married or leaving school to enter into further educational jobs. I feel that it is impossible to justify the exclusion of 16 and 17-year-olds from the right to vote when we are already able to take on a wide range of responsibilities. And she continued, I also believe that including 16 and 17 year olds in voting will help to engage them into our expanding democracy. In the Scottish Youth Parliament elections in March this year, 70,000 young people aged 12 to 25 voted to elect their local MSYP. That in itself demonstrates that young people, when given the chance to vote, are passionate about having a voice in matters that have an effect on them, not only at a local level, but at a national level too. Presiding officer, I couldn't have put it better myself. Labour members are happy to support the bill to give 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote. Many thanks. And I now call on Alex Johnston. Six minutes, please. Can I begin by uh, commending the presiding officer for the action she took earlier on today uh, to ensure that the business that preceded this debate was given adequate time. This is an important bill that we're discussing uh, and we should give it the due reverence concerned, but with the degree of agreement that exists between the parties, perhaps there will be less argument today than we've seen on some subjects recently. The Scottish Conservative Party, of course, opposed the extension of the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds in the referendum franchise bill last year. We had a number of reasons for doing that, some of which still concern us today. But the experience of seeing how 16 and 17 year olds contributed to the debate, participated uh, in the, the activities that went on during the referendum campaign and then came out in large numbers to vote in, on both sides in the referendum is an indication of the willingness of that age group to participate in our electoral process. In fact, if you look very carefully at it, uh, I think there is a huge opportunity here to engage young people at a stage where they will be enthused by politics and will continue to participate in the electoral process as they get older. This contrasts with the situation that exists in some places 
including south of the border, perhaps, where young voters are reluctant to become involved at the, even at the age of 18 and vote in much smaller numbers until they are significantly older. However, there are a number of inconsistencies that do need to be addressed. One of those is, of course, the fact that we quite often in this chamber talk about the appropriate age for individuals to be given certain responsibilities. And while it's easy to blame the government for inconsistency, I believe it's a, a something that could, any government could be blamed for because there are always arguments made for increasing an age limit for buying alcohol and an off licence, for example, to 21, uh, and then reducing the voting age to 16. Perhaps as we go forward beyond this legislation, we need to take a more coherent attitude to how we give responsibility to young people. I, for one, would always take the view that encouraging young people to take responsibility early is the best way to make them responsible citizens. Moving on from that situation, there were, of course, concerns expressed by Conservatives before which have been addressed in the process uh, of preparing and analysing this bill at stage one. There is, of course, that two diametrically opposing needs when we take young people onto the register. The need to have transparency. The need for us to know that everything is fair and above board. But at the same time, the equally important, perhaps more important ne necessity to ensure that the identities and the information of the, these young people are appropriately protected. And that's why this legislation does a great deal of work to ensure that those who are taken onto the register before the age of 16 are given that appropriate protection. We have, of course, also heard uh, in the Minister's opening remarks that uh, progress is being made on some key issues. The issues of looked after children uh, and care leavers are, of course, vital. And I'm delighted to hear that that is already being addressed. Data protection, of course, will be key. But one of my biggest concerns is one that's been discussed by a number of people already, and that is how education, our schools and our colleges, will take responsibility for political uh, and electoral discourse during future elections. It's my experience in the past that it was not unusual for a school to invite candidates at election time to go in and address uh, a whole cross-section of classes. But then there was a time when fewer children stayed on to the school, at school to the age of 18, and very few had a vote while they were at school. The fact that most of our young people now stay on uh, later in the education system, and also now will have a vote as early as 16, means that real political campaigning for the first time could be taken into our schools. And going back once again to my experience of the referendum campaign, I was particularly disappointed by some of the decisions that were made in relation to the involvement of schools in Aberdeenshire, for example, where there was a, an involvement in the process at a very early stage, a year before the referendum took place, but in the latter days of that campaign, just as young people were becoming enthused, the school authorities appeared to clamp down on any engagement. There is also always a legitimate concern that people in positions of responsibility within our schools might somehow abuse their position for some political gain. It has never been my experience, either as a pupil or as a parent, that that has happened. In fact, I've perhaps mentioned before that the two ladies who inspired me to become involved in politics were teachers at my secondary school. They are both now enjoying their retirement in a slightly heartbroken way because I believe they were both paid up members of the Labour Party. But what they taught me, uh, what they taught me was, not, was not what to think, it was how to think. <laughs> In bringing my remarks to a close, I believe this piece of legislation is vitally important. It is uh, at the leading edge of these decision-making processes. Uh, we uh, will be making history when we invite 16 and 17-year-olds to participate in the election for this chamber next year. 
I believe that the experience of the referendum has taken myself and one or two others in this chamber uh, to a place where we are now comfortable in engaging with younger people in the electoral process. And I look forward to a chamber elected by an electorate that includes everyone in Scotland from the age of 16 onwards. And I hope that it will be a better political environment as a result. Thank you very much. We now turn to the open debate. And looking at the time just now, it seems that speeches could go up to five minutes, but not beyond. I call Rob Gibson to be followed by John Pentland. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, take part in particular focus on the public awareness campaigns and schools, which have been mentioned already. But uh, I want to uh, refer back to uh, evidence that we took in the referendum bill campaign uh, uh, scrutiny on the 21st of March uh, 2013. In questions I asked of uh, Bruce Robertson, the representative of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, and I asked about the discussions of the referendum in personal and social education and in modern studies classes. And he said, I do not want to get into the technicalities of the curriculum. Not every school offers modern studies. So we need to ensure that there are opportunities in every secondary school's curriculum. That is where work and collaboration across the 32 education authorities and with, Scottish, uh, with School Leaver Scotland, um, would, uh, which is an association of secondary head teachers, will enable people clearly to understand what's happening. That is what we all aspire to. We cannot have a situation in which a set of children in Helensborough has an opportunity to engage that is very different from the opportunity that children in Helmsdale get. And Mary Pitkethley, wearing her hat as a chief executive, agreed that she would be interested to make sure that the guidance was consulted on and expect schools to use the material that's made available. Well, I'm delighted that the uh, Deputy First Minister has talked about that in terms of this bill, but it is clear that in the referendum campaign, the advice of Bruce Robertson was not uh, adhered to, was not carried out, and indeed left many schools with a very great disadvantage for their uh, school students. And the recommendation in our report that Education Scotland should review and update its guidance in order to ensure consistency in this area in the context of the extension of the franchise to a much larger number of school pupils, including the types of activities that can be permitted in schools as best practice during any period of PERDA, and that such guidance should be communicated to all local authorities in all schools, is absolutely key to ensuring that there is no risk aversion in schools from recognising that the educative uh, role of teachers is not being breached, it is being enhanced. And I want to make sure that people understand just exactly that their role is not to clamp down on debate, but to increase it and to increase that participation. I have experience in Allness Academy, near to where I live, of 12-year-olds in the debating society being stopped debating the subject in hand because of the kind of risk aversion, first of all, of the head teachers and possibly of the local authorities. And the kind of evidence that we had when we asked local authorities about their guidance led us into a maze of gobbledygook. As far as I'm concerned, we found that many children were denied the right to take part in that approach, and that's why I welcome the fact that uh, Education Scotland has been given this role now, and that, in fact, we will have a chance at last to set a new standard for the awareness and raising of uh, the campaigns in our schools. I'm not going to take up much more time, because I think that's a key point that has to be made there. But I'm delighted that MSPs from across the party lines overwhelmingly voted in favour of extending the right to, to vote uh, 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 to, uh, in the Scottish Parliament and local elections to include 16 and 17 year olds. One of the greatest achievements of last year's independence referendum was to extend the franchise to young adults. Young people grasp the opportunity, as many have said, to become involved in the democratic process with both hands. This bill embeds their right to vote in Scotland's national and local elections, and I welcome this move, which, as Bruce Crawford said, is historic.
Thank, Thank you, you very much. Could I remind members who wish to speak in the debate they should press the request to speak buttons, please? I call John Pentland to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Sir, when we debated the right to vote in the referendum, I said then that the right to vote should be extended to 16-year-olds in all elections. So any doubt about extending the franchise for 16- and 17-year-olds to vote was surely put to bed when their vote helped to deliver a turnout of nearly 85% showing that they had the motivation and maturity and known their vote would and could change things. If we had enough confidence in young people then, surely we can trust them to take part in electing a government for five years. Mr Pentland, could I ask you to move your microphone round slightly? I'm not sure if the sound has gone quieter this afternoon, but we're having trouble hearing you. Thank you. Okay. To argue against us, would be out of sync with other areas where, where they are considered sufficiently mature to make their own mind up. They can join the army, they can get married, they can work full time, they can even fly a glider. So it's absurd to exclude 16 and 17 year olds from voting. Of course, it might be we also need to review what else they can, can and can't do at particular ages for the sake of consistency. But that is a discussion for another day and one that we may end up having to a say in themselves if we agree to this bill. I can see it being quite tempting to seek the votes of 16 and 17 year olds by promising them more rights to go alongside their franchise. During the referendum campaign, I visited schools, including a Hussings at St Aidan's High School with Alex Neal and Margaret Mitchell, where everyone was so very well behaved, even without Glenn Campbell, you know, to keep us in order. Now, during that campaign, I met many young voters from all parties, some of whom took the next step and became energetic and enthusiastic participants in leafleting, canvassing and street campaigning. That enthusiasm, enthusiasm needs to be harnessed and maintained, and hopefully extending the franchise for the Scottish elections will help do that. The other side of the coin, however, was a real eye-opener, as they witnessed the ugliness associated with the campaign. Posters being trashed, people followed by people with cameras, and physical and verbal intimidation. The social media deba debate was often not much better, and sometimes disgustingly worse. Not the best advert for political involvement. And I really do think that if we want young people to develop a lifelong commitment to democratic debate based on political principle, we need to strive for higher standards of behaviour and greater respect being shown among so-called so grown-ups who should know better. Many technical aspects to the bill will be reviewed in more, more detail as the bill progresses. And one of the most important as a mechanism will be to ensure that young people are registered to vote. I know that a large percentage of eligible voters under 18 were successfully included on the register for election, and this was no doubt helped by the inclusion of attainers on the register. Young people who could become eligible to vote while registered was current. Similarly, if we agree to lower the age of franchise, then we need to ensure that young attainers aged 14 and 15 are included. The bill therefore includes provisions as allowing electoral register officers to access education records. And this will require consideration of how the system works in conjunction with other legislation designed to protect the interests of those under 16. In addition to changes that may result from lowering the franchise age, there are of course other changes to the registration that are being brought into operation this year. The bill has technical provisions made with these issues in mind, but these must be subject to thorough scrutiny to ensure that they are truly fit for purpose. So in conclusion, President Officer, this is a final stage of a long journey for voting age. It has travelled from being 21 or 30 for women when they first got the vote via the reduction to 18 in 1970. And at each stage, there have been voices raised over the extension of franchise but time has set settled those arguments. I cannot see us going further than 16, but I su suspect that adopting this for other elections is just a matter of time. 
So blazing the trail for 16 and 70 year olds to vote in Scottish elections is a significant step forward in our democracy and one that, that I hope paves the way for the UK to follow suit. Thank you very much. I now call Linda Fabiani to be followed by Alison McInnes. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I note what uh, John Pentland and Jackie Bailey um, also um, said about their concerns about the vulnerability of attainers going on to the register, etc. This was something that uh, some of us who are on the current Committee for Devolution and Further Powers looked at in the Referendum Bill Committee as well in terms of extending the franchise very extensively. And uh, certainly the view of the Scottish Government this time around that it's different from the referenda, uh, sorry, the referendum legislation um, because of the Section 3063 order allowing flexibility in the approach that can be taken, etc., as detailed in the committee report this time round, uh, didn't seem to be disagreed with in any way by those experts who came and gave evidence. But I, I would concede that it's such an important issue that there's never any harm in looking at these things again. Ms Fabiani, could I stop you for a second? I'm going to ask Broadcasting if they can consider whether the microphones could be turned up slightly, because I don't usually have an issue with hearing you in the chamber, oh, but I'm afraid this afternoon I do. <laughs> Presiding officer, would you like me to yell? <laughs> That's better, thank you. <laughs> OK. Well, you threw me there. <laughs> um, I really actually enjoyed... Um, the, this scrutiny this time round because it was underpinned with the, the absolute joy that, that we were extending that franchise beyond the referendum uh, to Scottish Parliament elections. And I hope um, that we can extend that to all elections sooner rather than later, um, to follow on from what John Pentland said. Because I thought what was really important was that the, the key finding from the committee's discussions with first-time voters was that they believed that they were fully capable of making an informed decision at the independence referendum and agreed, therefore, that that franchise should be extended to allow them to vote in Scottish Parliament elections. And it was absolutely wonderful to see that um, knowledge and confidence that came with so many young people who gave us evidence. Um, Bruce Crawford, as convener, mentioned one of the committee studies. But if you look beyond that to other studies that were carried out, um, February 2015, a BBC survey, 70% of respondents to it in Scotland believed it was important to vote, and 67% of respondents in Scotland agreed that politics was an effective way to make a difference to the country. Now, these figures were the highest of any part of the UK, and I think it's a direct result um, of people, young people particularly, becoming engaged in the referendum process. I have uh, four senior schools in my constituency of East Kilbride, Calder, Glen, Duncan, Rig, St Andrews and St Brides and Sanderson School. And I have been fascinated um, at the way, and the very articulate and sensible thinking way um, that young people, not just uh, 16 and beyond, but um, from going into senior school and even before that, some of the primary schools, the way they can engage and understand the issues and want to be part of where the country is moving forward to. Extremely important. And again, um, for me, the best evidence of all that we received at the committee discussing these things was from Louise Cameron, um, the Chair of the Trustees of the Scottish Youth Parliament. And it was lovely because Louise said, we were so happy that the vote was extended to 16 and 17 year olds at referendum. It's even better that it will be extended in all future Scottish elections. Getting the chance to vote in future elections is such a great opportunity because it really does encourage political participation among young people. And some might say, oh yes, the young people would say that, but it's then backed up by academics, including Dr Jan Eichhorn of the University of Edinburgh, who made it very, very clear that whilst the referendum was a special occasion, the long-term engagement that comes with having been engaged in that special engagement is marked. And he also made it very plain that the issues that Rob Gibson spoke about were extremely important, because we did find disparity in how different local authorities applied the rules. 
I, I heard uh, from John Pentland there that North Lanarkshire was allowing politicians into school. That didn't happen in South Lanarkshire. There was just one uh, big debate that all the schools in South Lanarkshire were allowed to send a few representatives along to. I think that wasn't good enough. I do think um, it's good that everyone who knows best has come forward and says national guidance would be the best way forward. And I would urge us all to engage with that as far as possible to make sure that we're not just extending the franchise to our young people, but that we are extending the right to be properly and well informed. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Alison McInnes to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thanks very much. The Scottish Liberal Democrats have long campaigned for votes at 16 and we are delighted at the cross-party consensus that has emerged on this issue and, and will, of course, support the bill at decision time today. Given the chance to vote for the first time, young people undoubtedly embrace the opportunities the independence referendum presented. Young people on both sides spoke eloquently at public meetings and joined us all on the campaign trail. Schools throughout my North East East region held hotly contested mock referendums, but this time thousands of people were also able to proceed to take part for real. But I know that not all local authorities allowed such activity, so I welcome the committee's recommendation that Education Scotland should review and update its guidance to ensure that there is more participation uh, in uh, debate. Speaking to young people on the doorstep, it was evident that young people were among the, the best informed and most engaged of the electorate. And I was really heartened to see them stride into the polling stations with a real sense of purpose. I've never seen anything quite like it in my 20 or so years of being involved in politics. So we must ensure that their appetite to be involved, their palpable excitement at casting their vote is not a one-off. And of course it's incumbent on us to help sustain their interest in how our country is run from local council chambers to Westminster. And I am hopeful that this bill will act as a catalyst for wider reform, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. I never doubted the ability of young people to make informed decisions. But if anybody did, that should no longer be in doubt. At 16, as others have said, you can join the forces, you can get married, and crucially, you can pay taxes. And if a government can take your earnings, it should also accept your vote. Civic responsibilities should, of course, be balanced with civic rights. So, Presiding Officer, I'm proud that Liberal Democrats played a key role in reaching this, because it was, of course, Liberal Democrats in the UK government who delivered the provision to allow 16- and 17-year-olds to vote in the referendum through the Edinburgh Agreement. And we ensured that the devolution of the powers that members are discussing today were fast-tracked so that young people can, from next May, have a say in who represents them. So the vote later today is an important step, but I'm also under no illusions. There are other young people who will continue to be disengaged, disillusioned with politics, parties and politicians. Young people who don't believe they are represented. And we will need to find other ways, aside from lowering the voting age, to address this apathy and strengthen our democracy. Presiding officer, I appreciate the scope of this bill and the order is tight. However, it's important to note that this legislation will not grant every 16 and 17 year old a vote. As the committee's report highlights, it doesn't amend section three of the Representation of the People Act 1983. And it's regrettable therefore that around 100 young people in Cornton Vale, Polmont and HMP Grampian will remain disenfranchised. Members might recall my attempt to extend a referendum franchise to some short term prisoners. That was blocked by this government so I have to say I was surprised yesterday to find an ally in the former Justice Secretary, Kenny McCaskill. The latest in a string of crises of conscience, he reportedly told a newspaper it was shameful of the SNP to continue to deny prisoners the vote. And he said it could no longer hide behind the franchise being reserved to Westminster. Why did he and the Scottish Government not extend the franchise when they could? According to Mr McCaskill, it was for fear of the right-wing press fear of negative headlines, or as he put it, needless distractions that might damage the campaign for independence. The Scottish Government-backed blanket ban on prisoner voting isn't legal, fair or progressive, and I look forward to the day when that is resolved. Presiding Officer, the importance of 16 and 17-year-olds to our society is finally being properly recognised, and today we can celebrate the next step towards giving thousands of young people the opportunity to vote in elections in this Parliament. 
Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you very much, President Officer. I, I welcome this debate uh, today and uh, I'm looking forward to voting uh, for it at 5pm uh, this evening. And also the key provision in this bill is to lower the voting age uh, to allow 16 and 17 year olds full representation uh, in the democracy in Scotland. Um, and just, I think just one point I do want to raise. I've actually been having this discussion with my daughter, explaining to her about what we're actually trying to do. Now, she is a wee bit disappointed that she's not going to get a chance to vote for her father next year. But at the moment, she's only eight. She will be nine. Uh, but I have explained to her that it's going to, it might take a bit longer uh, for that to actually happen, maybe another uh, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. But uh, we'll see how that progresses in, in the future. Uh, but uh, certainly, the, the, our committee... Pardon? Oh, sorry, OK. Alec Johnson. I was just going to remind the member that uh, one of the things that came out of the research that was done in advance of this is that children don't necessarily follow their parents and their voting intentions. Stuart McMillan. <laughs> I know I haven't followed my mother's voting intentions, but I'm sure my daughter will follow her father's. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, certainly, the devolution, the devolution for the Powers Committee. Uh, certainly, uh, we, took, we took evidence from various respondents, uh, as well as conducting uh, the online surveys we've heard. Uh, and certainly, there was this overwhelming support for extending the franchise to younger voters. And the, the online survey um, that, uh, that, we, that we undertook uh, across Scotland it, it had... It, we also spoke to those who participated in the independence referendum, also asking their views uh, and also on their experience of voting in the referendum. Uh, as, uh, as a convener of the committee mentioned earlier, uh, we received over 1,000 responses to the survey, uh, and with 85% of them agreeing that uh, it was right to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in the referendum, with 79% agreeing that 16 and 17 year olds should be allowed to vote in elections to the UK Parliament uh, and the Scottish Parliament and to local authorities. And the results from this online survey also highlighted that nearly 36% of respondents campaigned for either side of the debate, uh, whilst one in four actually joined a political party. Now, I, I don't know of anyone who could ar argue that, that that actually wasn't a positive case for increasing the franchise uh, to the people uh, of Scotland. And the level of engagement of younger voters in politics, particularly in Scotland, it was also seen in the survey by BBC Newsbeat. Uh, that was conducted in February of this year. And the survey found that following the referendum, young people in Scotland, and the survey was done between 18 and 24-year-olds, the, 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 they were more politically engaged than young people in any other nation or region of the UK. And it highlighted that 70% of respondents in Scotland believe that it's important to vote. That's the highest percentage of any region or nation within the UK, 67% of respondents in Scotland agreed that politics is an effective way to make a difference to the country. That's the highest of any nation or region within the UK. And 76% of respondents in Scotland agreed that voting is an important part of being involved in society. Once again, that's the highest of any nation or region within the UK. Now, these two surveys highlight the interest and even the demand from younger voters to get engaged in electoral politics almost 110,000 16 and 17 year olds registered to vote in an independence referendum. And according to the Electoral Commission survey, 75% of these young people voted. Of those who reported voting, 97% said they would vote again. Now, support for this change in the franchise was also obvious from the evidence received by the committee from a number of respondents representing a range of individuals and organisations now. Uh, my colleague Linda Fabiani touched upon it, Louise Cameron uh, from the, the Youth Parliament uh, earlier on, so I'm, I won't go over that particular part uh, of the, the evidence. But we also heard information from YouthLink, uh, and they also stated that uh, the bill addresses the inequality that young people aged 16 and 17 year olds have historically faced. The discrepancy between the democratic rights and responsibilities. 16 and 17 years, as we know, we can join the armed forces, they can pay tax, they can enter employment and subject, uh, they can get married and drive a car, yet they were deemed too immature to cast a vote in an election. And we have experienced in Scotland, through what we have experienced, uh, certainly throughout this referendum, uh, was a blossoming of a new political generation as younger voters became engaged, not just in voting, but in becoming active in politics. It's therefore unfortunate, I would suggest, that, um, that with the EU referendum uh, going to take place, that 16 and 17 year olds won't be allowed to take part in that, as well as obviously not having the opportunity to vote in the recent UK election. But I hope that certainly will change in the future. And I would urge the Conservative members in the Chamber today to talk to their colleagues in Westminster to try to extend that franchise for the upcoming EU refer referendum. And certainly, in summary, uh, officer, 
Uh, I absolutely welcome, wholeheartedly welcome, uh, the key finding from the committee's discussions that the first time voters uh, was that pupils believed that they had shown they were fully capable of making an informed decision at the independence referendum, and that a significant majority uh, actually agreed that the franchise should be extended to allow them to vote McMillan, you need to in close, future please. Scottish parliamentary and local elections. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Can I ask members to keep to five minutes, please? Um, Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Christina McKay. From McHale. this important bill and the beneficial consequences that I think I'll, will flow from it in terms of empowering young people and increasing their engagement in politics. I'm sure we were all in the chamber hugely encouraged by the level of interest engagement that we saw from young people uh, during the referendum. I'm equally sure that we all took part in uh, meetings uh, with young people and were impressed with the, the level of knowledge and questioning that we had, uh, at least the equal of uh, what we received from, from, from older people. So I now think we have an opportunity to ensure that that participation lasts and becomes a salient feature uh, of our political uh, culture. I'm glad that that reasoning is now widely shared among uh, political parties. Uh, the, the Labour Party had votes for 15, uh, sorry, 16 and 17 year olds across the board in its uh, recent election manifesto and indeed the SNP, Greens and Liberal Democrats had adopted that policy uh, uh, at an earlier uh, time. All of those parties, I think, understand uh, the positive consequences this could have uh, in tackling uh, dissolu the disillusionment uh, many young people feel when it comes to politics. And I do regret the fact that the current uh, UK government hasn't uh, accepted uh, that position uh, when it comes uh, to its own elections, obviously, uh, for its own parliament, but also more immediately for the forthcoming uh, EU referendum. Obviously, I hope they will change uh, their minds on that. And I would ask them, and in fact, other people, and we know there are other people who are still sceptical about this, uh, whether in Scotland or further afield, I would ask them to uh, reflect on two points. And I think the first of these two points is a piece of incontrovertible evidence, because they should listen to the voices of those young people who did vote in September uh, and if, hear the effect that their inclusion has had uh, on this generation uh, of voters. And obviously, Bruce Crawford and Jackie Bailey have referred to some of that evidence, and I'll do so myself in a moment. But the second thing I hope that uh, people who are sceptical about this bill and similar uh, proposals should uh, bear in mind is that it, that it could well have positive outcomes, not just, I think, for political knowledge and civic participation, but also, I think, for our uh, education system. And, and those points I'll try and come to as well if I've got time. Now, I won't quote all the figures. Some have been quoted already uh, from the Devolution Committee's uh, survey, and I would commend them for that piece of work as well as the report more generally. 92% of the young people surveyed voted in the referendum, a significant turnout by any standards. 840 of the voters felt that it was easy or quite easy to vote. 44 per cent of the young voters felt well informed on the major issues involved in the referendum debate, with almost 30 per cent feeling quite well informed. I think that means even better informed. And that's a large majority of the young voting Democratic stating that they'd done the reading, taken on board the messages and made an informed choice. Um, reading into the small detail of voter engagement, 16 to 18, uh, of those 16 to 18 went to a variety of sources for information, 68% uh, reading official campaign materials online or via social media, 65.5% from traditional media. So I think the general conclusion I would draw from all that is young people took this very seriously and made sure they were uh, very uh, well uh, informed. And that's an incredible legacy and an, an opportunity as well, of course, to learn how young people interact with contemporary politics. And some of us are, are trying to catch up, of course, in terms of our use of social media and other uh, forms. And this leads, I think we've got time for this, to the second persuasive argument that I've suggested for lowering the voting Age, namely that it could provide a catalyst for updating political education in our schools. The curriculum could benefit from the kind of lessons in citizenship uh, and civic power that may not have been afforded to many uh, of us uh, older voters. In the Democratic Audit UK report entitled Should the UK Lower the Voting Age to 16, Research associates Richard Berry and Sean Kippen made clear that lowering the voting age is an important part of the solution to disillusionment and a kind of politics that is done to 
rather than done with citizens. They make clear it's not the only answer uh, to that. But I do think uh, this is an important part of the debate. The committee made certain recommendations on this. I heard what the Cabinet Secretary said. I think perhaps uh, I would prefer to have a more, um, more radical uh, development of the curriculum for excellence to, to actually make sure that uh, people of 16 and 17 are uh, uh, extremely well informed uh, for uh, the voting that they would then be entitled to do. Um, um, Ed Miliband, in fact, on Labour more generally during the general election, sorry to mention that twice in one speech, talked about a, a, a redesigned uh, curriculum um, uh, and obviously that applied to England rather than Scotland, but they, they were saying as part of the 16 to 17 year olds you have to redesign the curriculum in preparation for. So I hope Curriculum for Excellence will take on in a Scottish context uh, the need to uh, and the opportunity to really develop political Mr. and Chesney, civic close, education please. as part of this proposal. Thank you very much. Christina McKelvey to be followed by Graham Pearson. President officer, it strikes me that referenda are a bit like buses. You don't see any for ages and suddenly you get two within a close period of time. And Scotland is perhaps at the vanguard of a yes-no voting strategy. In our referendum, we recognise the importance of giving 16 and 17-year-olds right to a view or, um, to a, a view on their future. And more than 109,000 registered to do just that. And boy, did they give us their opinions. And they want to give us their opinions in next year's Scottish elections. That group, presiding officer, including my 16-year-old son, having become so involved and engaged in politics, were rightly frustrated at being denied the opportunity at the Westminster elections. They are to be denied it again in the EU referendum, unless... Combined resources of our Labour colleagues, SNP colleagues, the Liberal Democrats, and I hope some of our Conservative colleagues lodge an amendment and uh, realise that amendment to change that. Presiding officer, voting structure, structures like democracy itself need to evolve and change to reflect the needs of society. We have moved on from a time when only the landed gentry could vote, where women were excluded and the poor had no political voice at all. And I do welcome my Conservative colleagues' conversion to support this bill. Maybe they could use that conversion to encourage some of their colleagues at Westminster. The Scottish Parliament has been created on a fundamental principles of equality. There may be some issues around a hybrid form of constituency and list votes, but most people agree that it is a far better option than first past the post. But, presiding officer, no system is unbreakable. No democracy can be unaccountable. Change that improves access and engagement in political life has to be a big positive. People in Scotland have learned that they have a voice and they've used that voice and they can genuinely make a difference to the future of their country. And by people, I mean everyone with a critical opinion, including 16 and 17 year olds. Teenagers have a fundamental right to express and opine about their future. So who owns the future? Who will be the people who make the money, pay the pensions for us, no doubt, buy the houses, raise their families, acquire the skills to run a prosperous economy? The answer is obvious. Presiding officer, away back in 1967, when Dr Winifred Ewan won her House of Commons seat in the constituency of Hamilton, which I represent now, she used her maiden speech in 1967 to campaign for a lowering of the voting age to 16. We are still waiting for London to catch up, but we can be proud of ourselves in Scotland that we are working to achieve this. With cross-party support, within 15 years of our own parliament, we look likely to achieve that aim. Why Westminster needs centuries to pass such fundamental legislation remains a bit of a mystery for me. And for Westminster to sit in the last century by not giving the vote to 16 and 17 year olds, but also to deny the right in the EU referendum of EU nationals, the right to vote, I find astonishing. For the moment at least, and while our MPs work to change at Westminster, we can lead from the front here at our own elections next year. Even the Smith Commission, not renowned for its forward thinking views and devolved powers, recognised that Scotland must have the right to give younger voters this opportunity. Presiding officer, I ask for this, not just for my son, because believe me, he's watching on the telly now and ensuring that I do ask on his behalf. 
but for all of those young people who had the right to vote, for all of those young people, for all of our sons, for all of our daughters in Scotland, that they can lead the way, not just in the independence referendum, not just in the EU referendum, but in every election that they have a stake in. So let us encourage the political engagement that was so evident among Scottish young people in the referendum. Let us indeed give them the right to express a view on their future, on the future of this parliament, on the future for their children. Presiding officer, I support the Scottish elections referendum of voting age bill when it comes to the vote at five o'clock tonight. Many thanks. And now call on Graham Pearson to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Five minutes, please. Presiding officer, thanks very much for allowing me to contribute to this debate. I stand and wholeheartedly support the general pr principles of the bill. Uh, I think it right to acknowledge the work of the committee and the convener of the committee in preparing the, the work for this parliament and seeing this bill on its way. Uh, it's an important to uh, move forward and it strikes me as one old enough to remember the heat that used to remain within the debate of could we trust our young people to make conscious decisions in a political vein that today we seem very relaxed. Even our colleague from the Conservative Party, eh, who on the benefit of his education was led into politics, although he almost breached consensus at one point, he saved the day by eh, his summation of the benefits to be achieved by involving our young people. I do, however, welcome Mr Swinney's acknowledgement of the sensitivities in relation to education and the part that schools will play in the future. And in that context, eh, my own experience in the south of Scotland with the secondary schools there show that schools are capable of taking a sober approach to the topics of, of politics and indeed it may well benefit to those who decide the way forward to gain experience from Stranraer Academy who played a, a substantial part in a project parliament that all parts of, of this parliament fed into uh, where modern study students learn something of the democratic processes of this Scottish parliament and indeed hosted a debate in their school to which each of the parties in this chamber contributed. And it was without doubt a challenging evening and one that showed that those who are 16 and 17 are indeed keen to play their part in Scottish politics and do understand the role that politics played, plays now in their day-to-day -day experience. Uh, I reaffirm Bruce Crawford's commitment on behalf of his committee to ensuring the safety of our young people where data is to be managed. That is obviously a very serious issue as we go forward and one fears, and I know that the, the government will take seriously, the mistakes that can be made in moving forward in this exciting time and overlooking the needs of those who are looked after children, those who are within secure accommodation, uh, those who have additional support needs. That sometimes in preparing the way forward, we can too glibly decide how we might manage things on their behalf. We need to think soberly about their particular needs if we are to genuinely say there is social justice in Scotland and that we include people who very often are forgotten, too often are overlooked, and by experience we see are left behind. So in this time of a commitment to engaging with as wide a representation as we can, those elements of young people who aren't in the main catchment, who are not fortunate enough to have the support of their families around them, that we take an extra step on their behalf, even although it takes time, even although it may cause additional expense, if we are to bring those elements of, of young people who are, in many respects, deprived of a, a modern way of living, that we give them the step to become involved in politics and to understand the issues that we discuss here in this chamber and allow them to connect that to their experience of day-to-day -day life. Only by engaging them in that fashion can we, can we truly uh, give them access to 
modern life to public life and allow them to feel that they are part of what we do here in, in this uh, chamber. The final point that I would make that hasn't been made thus far, but was certainly my own experience, was not only did we engage with young people of 16 and 17, but through them, they ensured by some deem of pressure that their parents became involved in the political process yet again. And certainly in the schools in the south of Scotland, we found that young people forced their parents out of an evening to come with them to the school to engage in the debates that occurred there. And I found that a, a most invigorating experience and one I would commend to my colleagues here in the Parliament. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Alison Johnson. Presiding Officer, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. The current political re-engagement of many of the population that we've seen since the run-up to the independence referendum has certainly seen a very significant shift in attitudes and interest towards politics generally in Scotland. This change was especially so amongst 16 and 17-year-olds who, having been offered the prospect of being able to make a decision on their future, moved towards a very significant interest in politics the closer it became to polling day. As others have said, the online survey of 16 and 17 year olds conducted by the committee found that 80% watched at least one of the major televised debates and 63% found out more about politics and most impressively 26% joined a political party. This is at least some evidence of how engaged young people were. It's in my view vitally important that we respond to that. Indeed it appears as a result of the referendum that this engagement seems to have continued. In Dr. Jan Eichhorn of the University of Edinburgh's written submission to the committee, he said that of 18 to 19-year-olds, who would have been 16 to 17-year-old during the referendum campaign in Scotland, 63% said they would certainly vote in the general election in 2015, as opposed to only 27% in England. In no other age group was this difference so substantial, implying that there may be more than a general referendum effect, which we would have seen across all age groups. By contrast, um, since the general election, Mori uh, have conducted a poll which suggests that throughout the United Kingdom, only 43% of 18 to 24 year olds voted, as opposed to three quarters of pensioners. I'm not sure I haven't seen any Scottish breakdown. So clearly throughout the UK, there is work to be done. Uh, in addition, other work by the Pew Research Center suggests that the gap between American youth turnout and overall turnout has changed little in 40 years, whereas in Britain, that gap has widened dramatically. So it's clearly a cause for concern in the United Kingdom as a whole. Presiding officer, we live in an age in which one of the preferred means of public communication and forum is that of social media. As masters of that medium, 16 and 17 year olds have potentially greater access to information than ever before. But schools have a very important part to play. As Bruce Adamson of the Child Law Centre says in his submission to the committee, the primary duty of the state is to provide education for children. And as Dr. Jan Nikon said, discussing political issues in schools increases pupils' confidence in ways nothing else does. So we know how important it will be to ensure that that uh, information is replicated throughout Scotland in every school, not propaganda, but informed guidance. Early engagement with politics, understanding the political process is vital. And at a time when young people are expected to move on to the next stage in their lives, whether that be in education, in an apprenticeship or full-time employment, it's only right that we also invite them to fully participate in the democracy that we all value at the very earliest opportunity. Research evidence from Norway and Austria suggests that 16 and 17 year old first time voters and people that vote in the first election they're actually eligible to vote in are more likely to vote in the future, i.e. they get into the habit of voting and then they continue to do so. So it's important to get them into that habit at the very earliest opportunity. The high turnout during the independence referendum and the slightly lesser turnout in the recent general election, which was still much better than in 2010. So that gave us all, I hope, some satisfaction in Scotland. Turnout, even in such traditionally low voting areas, such as Glasgow and North East, improved considerably. Presiding officer, under the new Conservative Westminster government, we now approach the prospect of an EU referendum. But instead of embracing the gold standard of the referendum, we seek to exclude not only EU citizens, such as Christian Allard, my colleague, but also 16 and 17 year olds. We're happy to allow citizens of Cyprus and Malta, who are of course EU states, but not 
long-term residents in the United King Kingdom, citizens of other EU states. Presiding officer, whilst we've gone forward with the Smith Commission on votes for 16 and 17-year-olds in Scotland, once again, Westminster is behind the times. Westminster, of course, now includes Mari Black MP, the youngest member of the Westminster Parliament since 1667. I commend her fantastic achievement. If ever there was an example of how a young person become, can become involved in politics from the very earliest opportunity, she is one. And of course, our own First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, joined the SNP at the age of 16. It's quite clear that there is cross-party support for this bill. There is an air of inevitability about this bill, but we clearly have a bigger battle to win at Westminster. As we know at Westminster, old habits die hard. It would be good, however, if this Parliament could encourage the 15, 16 and 17-year-olds of Scotland to use the time before the EU referendum bill becomes law to make Westminster know loudly and clearly at every stage that they should think again. As for this Parliament, let's progress this bill so that we can demonstrate to Westminster that we really do do things better in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, call on Alison Johnson, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank our first class clerks, well informed witnesses, and all who've contributed to our Stage 1 report on the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill. The committee does indeed support the general principles of the bill, principles that have long been part of Scottish Green Party policy. And just as last week's debate on the Smith draft clauses was a result of the engagement witnessed in the referendum, today's debate is an incredibly positive reflection of this increased political engagement and a concrete step to make it possible for that engagement to continue to its fullest extent in the act of voting itself for 16 and 17 year olds. The Scottish Youth Parliament campaigned for votes at 16 in the referendum, followed by all other elections and referendums. And they're not alone. The Votes at 16 campaign says, since 1998, we've been calling for votes at 16, and last year's Indie Ref was proof we're ready. And who could argue with that? Even those who were previously unconvinced recognised this involvement as appropriate, important, and quite frankly, right. We experienced at first hand the contribution young people make to the democratic process and wasn't it inspiring? And I'm delighted that we're on the road to enabling 16 and 17 year olds to vote in Scottish Parliament and Scottish local authority elections. And I've no doubt that if the UK government passed similar legislation at Westminster, they too would witness the passion and dedication that comes when young people are allowed to be fully involved with the democratic process and when they're given the right to vote. Presiding officer, many believed, and now we all know, that democracy is better when young people are involved. When young people cannot vote, we squander energy and we squander passion. And can we really afford to do that at a time when politics is so poorly regarded and when we all too often have woefully low voter turnout? Votes at 16 say, we want our political system to recognise the abilities of 16-year-olds to properly include us in our society and show us the trust and respect that society expects of us by giving us the right to vote. My committee colleagues agree that our evidence-taking session involving the Scottish Youth Parliament, Young Scott and the NUS was particularly lively, engaging and informative. Louise Cameron of the Scottish Youth Parliament was an inspirational witness and she pointed out that 16 and 17 year olds challenged their families about not going to the ballot box and she said, that maybe parents or others who've been disengaged from the political system have had their engagement revitalised. And there are those who will still insist that young people aren't equipped or well enough educated to vote. And I disagree wholeheartedly, as do colleagues who took part in debates where young people engaged and debated in an articulate, a passionate and a well-informed way. We've heard in media debate this week about the need to extend the franchise for the proposed EU referendum. And we know that young people are very well informed indeed, that they're able to access information and they have exposure to information that some older voters will never see. Because social media, as we've heard during this debate, is transforming the way we do many things. And its impact on politics and campaigning was clear to see in the referendum. Many pupils did benefit from taking part in fairly cheered debates with balanced panels. But as colleagues have noted, this wasn't the case in every local authority. An action to overcome the reluctance to host such debates, which seem to stem from concern about being partial, is essential. And Bill Scott from Inclusion Scotland summed up perfectly when he said, 
There's everything to gain from having national guidelines because they could break down those barriers and encourage education authorities to take a risk. That risk is worth taking because everybody has to take risks. One of the rites of passage is for young people to begin to make their own decisions and take chances. We need to allow people to make decisions from them, for themselves rather than doing it for them. Well, absolutely. Curriculums for Excellence aims to create confident individuals who are effective contributors and responsible citizens who participate responsibly in political, economic, social and cultural life. And involvement in our democratic process is a perfect way to enable this development. Now, Louise Cameron noted that while the school system this time missed some young people, practically everyone nowadays is on Facebook and Twitter. It's a valuable way to catch people. And she cited a hashtag on Twitter on the day before and on the referendum itself that encouraged people to go to the ballot box. And she noted that it received huge publicity. But with amendment, we can ensure a more equal playing field as the bill moves forward. The Votes at 16 website says the EU referendum will be a historic once in a lifetime vote. 16 and 17 year olds took their right to vote in the Scottish referendum with over 75% turnout. And now is the time for the government to give them a vote in the EU referendum. Westminster, I hope you are listening. Presiding officer, our work on this bill isn't the end of a process, it's clearly the beginning. The bill will be amended as it proceeds through Parliament and I hope that our experience in Scotland will demonstrate to those who still require convincing that the time has come to give all 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote. Thank you. Many thanks. Let me now move the closing speeches and I call on Animal Goldie six minutes, please. Presiding officer, this has been a positive and an interesting debate and can I too thank the committee for its work in producing the stage one report on the bill. There is nothing like the zeal of the convert, and my party has moved from an anxiety surrounding the reduction of the voting age to enthusiasm in supporting it for the Scottish Parliament and local government elections in Scotland. And as many others have indicated, um, our view changed when we saw at first hand the levels of engagement, interest in and knowledge of the issues in the referendum debate displayed so impressively by these young people. I was privileged to sit in the Referendum Scotland Bill Committee, chaired by that parliamentary deity, Mr Bruce Crawford. And we were, we were able to explore... We were able to... A divine intervention from Mr Crawford. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering if when you're in the House of Lords, given your new enthusiasm for votes at 16, you might bring forward an amendment to the EU Bill to allow that to happen there too. And Nabel Goldie. One step at a time, Mr Crawford. <laughs> the change in my party's attitude in this parliament to um, reducing the voting age has been a very challenging experience for us to adjust to, but nonetheless we adjust with pleasure. I have to say that uh, on the Referendum Scotland Bill Committee, we were able to explore thoroughly what a reduction in the voting age for the referendum might involve, what issues would arise, and areas where we considered care would be necessary. And I hope that exercise has been useful to the successor committee, the Devolution Further Powers Committee. I don't propose to dwell on the mechanics of creating a voting system for 16 and 17 year olds system has been tried, it has been tested. I'm sure any lessons learned or adjustments necessary uh, can be made. The broader issue is how we inform young people of the issues on which they will be voting, bearing in mind that some will still be attending school. And as other contributors have indicated, the balance to be struck is the ready provision of that information without veering into propaganda by either local authorities or teachers or other school staff. And I think this is of particular importance. If young people are to have the reassurance that out with the home, they can access such information, listen to debates, or even organise and participate in debates themselves and think through the issues for themselves. Presiding officer, I don't believe it's for governments to tell local authorities how to do their business, but I do believe some consistency of practice by local authorities is desirable. And I'm indebted to SPICE for their excellent paper in this area entitled Approaches of Local Authorities to the Scottish Independence Referendum and Schools. And I quote... It found at top line level 25 authorities agreed a policy on whether and how discussion of the referendum was to be permitted or encouraged in schools. 
Well, some authorities stated that their guidance had emphasised the importance of neutrality, so council staff were not to wear badges or symbols or emblems supporting either campaign or using slogans. Ensuring that all council staff retain neutrality in all issues relative to the, re the referendum and emphasising the rights of pupils to express their views freely. On more specific issues, almost all local authorities permitted, encouraged or actively supported schools to hold debates in the referendum. Aberdeen left the decision to individual schools while others stated that debates were not discouraged. That was the position of East Renfrewshire. Hardly perhaps a ringing uh, encouragement to young people. Only one local authority specifically said that debates in the referendum were not permitted in schools, and that was in Renfrewshire, my own home area. But Renfrewshire did organise four major hustings events at which parity of access to the new school-age voter constituency by the two campaigns was ensured. Again, participants, as other uh, contributors have indicated, in such debates seem varied, sometimes local, sometimes national uh, politicians. Interestingly, North Lanarkshire and West Lothian discouraged such external participation, while Inverclyde supported it. Some local authorities permitted mock referenda, but Dundee, for example, did not. And I merely give these illustrations from the Spice Paper, presiding officer, to indicate there is a disparate approach. And in fairness to local authorities, some may have felt nervous about permitting too much activity, fearing they might breach election law or their obligations of neutrality. But with one election experience of the reduced voting age behind us, it may be these authorities will now feel more relaxed observing what other authorities did. And there are examples of good practice. Presiding officer, I hope that Education Scotland, in considering the guidelines, will have a look at the models uh, contained in that SPICE analysis paper. I hope local authorities can be innovative as we approach next year's Scottish Parliament election. This is an exciting time for politics, heightened by the prospect of engaging thousands of new young voters in the electoral process. And our democracy in Scotland will be stimulated by their participation. I have pleasure in confirming my party will support the bill at stage one. I now call on Lewis Macdonald. Seven minutes or thereby. Please, Mr. Macdonald. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Some new laws lead social change. The ban on smoking in public places, which this Parliament enacted ten years ago, was a good example of that. Other new laws do not so much lead as follow. And this bill, I think, is an example of such a law, because it's clear from today's debate that the time is indeed right. Previous extensions of the franchise have in some cases been bitterly contested, from votes for working men in the 19th century to votes for women in the 20th. Other changes, like the extension of the franchise to 18-year-olds in 1969, quickly gained support because they reflected the spirit of the times. Before that, young people could not vote until they were 21, even though the school leaving age then was lower than it is now. Extending the franchise to over 18s made sense in the 1960s at a time when youth culture was emerging as never before and young people's access to education and knowledge was growing exponentially. And those young people of 1969 are now approaching the end of their working lives and a generation later the time has come for another change in the voting age. Indeed, a generation is long enough between changes in the voting age. It might also be the right length of time between referendums on the same question, as the current First Minister uh, said not so long ago. And indeed, the next European referendum uh, is some 40 years after the last one, and therefore a case in point. But this bill also raises some important questions, uh, and it's important that there are answers offered to those. A number of colleagues have addressed particular issues to do with looked after children, with young offenders, with young people with additional support needs, protecting the privacy of 14 and 15 year olds prior to their attaining the new reduced voting age of 16 is clearly important. And I was glad to hear the Deputy First Minister respond to the issue which has been raised around selection of jurors. There is no good reason why the date of attainment of 16 and 17 year olds should not continue to appear in the electoral register as at present, even if and when uh, vo the voting age is reduced to 16 across the board. Of course, uh, there is nothing uh, uniquely Scottish about constitutional referendums or indeed about votes at 16. The German land of Lower Saxony uh, can perhaps uh, claim to have led the way. But the Scottish angle here, of course, as a number of members have said, 
is last year's referendum and the high levels of engagement by 16 and 17 year olds in that referendum moved the debate on decisively. A number of the other questions that have been raised during the committee's consideration of this uh, are also significant. The introduction of individual electoral registration has ended the practice of a householder registering everyone in his or her household just at the point when larger numbers of younger household members will qualify to vote than ever before. That is inconvenient on one level, but it does provide a double incentive to ensure that those who are entitled to register to vote are given every opportunity to do so. And a, voting, a falling level of voter registration would be disappointing in all age groups and for younger voters in particular. It will be important to see in detail why the Scottish Government believes there is no ambiguity around the registration deadline in the Bill. And I hope Mr Swinney's letter on that subject will issue in advance uh, of Stage 2. But as we've, a number of members have said, the referendum engaged young people on both sides of the debate and also posed some new challenges for school. Senior secondary school students were no longer confined to mock elections until they reached the age of 18 at some point in their final year. They were now voting for real from fourth year onwards. It is perhaps not surprising that schools and education authorities became anxious about that and that they dealt with these challenges in different ways too. Teachers were voters as well and formed their own views and they, they realised and schools realised that teachers could not be seen to try to influence how pupils chose to vote Yet equally, they did not want to seem to want to close down debate. The referendum was a one-off event, but this bill turns that novel challenge from last September into a permanent feature of school life. That means schools must accommodate the debate and discussion that go with any election campaign. But of course, they must do so in the right way. Schools stand in local parentis, they act for and in place of parents for the duration of the school day. That relationship of trust between the school, the student and his or her family or carers applies at 16 or 17 or indeed at 18 as well as at a younger age. That is uh, the responsibility that lies with them. The role of school, the school in this context then is not just to instruct in how the system works or to provide a forum for debate. A school also has a particular duty to equip young people with the critical faculties they need to deal with the choices they face as independent adults. The ability to think for yourself matters to young people in all sorts of contexts, not least in evaluating and making judgments about things that are said in an election campaign. John Swinney told the Revolution Committee that young people should be enabled to reach a fair and dispassionate understanding of political process and choices, and I welcome the, his tone in addressing those issues today. But I'm sure he would agree that that must not simply mean political parties being given a platform in schools to make their case to an uncritical and captive audience. It must mean school students being taught the skills they need to ask the tough questions uh, they should ask of all concern and the support they need to do that with confidence. Democracy is not just about the right to vote, as Alison Johnson said. It is also about the ability to make informed choices. It is about a culture uh, of mutual tolerance of opposing views. These are the values that our schools should transmit and the revised guidance uh, which uh, uh, Education Scotland is to provide should support schools in doing that. Today's debate has, of course, gone beyond the terms of today's bill because the general principles providing for votes at 16 can be applied to other parliaments besides this one. And just as we had a referendum last year which made votes at 16 an established fact, so we will very soon have another referendum which will be just as significant for the younger generation. Scotland's devolved parliament led the way on the smoking ban 10 years ago. We will do so again on votes at 16 with this bill. This bill as it stands is not the last word in the subject, but it does point the way forward and where this parliament leads, I have no doubt that others will follow. Thanks. And I now call on John Swinney. Um, nine minutes earlier by Mr Swinney. Presiding officer, uh, Mr perhaps, Macdonald. Perhaps ten. Uh, <laughs> for you? Perhaps ten. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Uh, the, uh, Mr Macdonald um, remarked there that uh, it would be unhealthy for debate to take place in, uh, in, 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 uh, with tough and uncritical audiences. Uh, I feel as if I, feel, uh, if I face tough and uncritical audiences on a frequent basis um, when I appear in this parliament, but uh, today has been a slightly different occasion 
of greater unity of opinion. And Mr Crawford was absolutely correct in a point echoed by Mr Pentland that uh, this is a, a moment of history where Parliament essentially regularises for the purposes of our elections and local authority elections the participation of 16 and 17 year olds in the uh, electoral process. And I think one of the most pleasant parts of the debate has been the enthusiasm, if I would say even Ms Goldie described it as the, the zeal of the convert in Mr Johnson in the way he expressed his uh, opinion. I felt I, I unreservedly welcome that and I want to say formally to the Conservative Party that I uh, welcome the fact that they have taken uh, a more positive and enthusiastic stance on this point and I think it's to their credit that they've looked at the experience in the referendum and come to that conclusion. I felt as if Mr Johnson took it a bit far because he did speculate that um, the addition of 16 and 17 year olds would perhaps create better political times. Uh, I, if that was a, a note of optimism that all 16 and 17 year olds in the future elections might vote Scottish Conservative, I think that is, well, perhaps a heroic assumption, Mr Johnson, <laughs> to be made on this occasion. But I wish Mr Johnson well in trying to pursue um, that particular objective, uh, the length and breadth uh, of uh, Scotland. Um, Alison McInnes made the point that, of course, this, uh, the provision of voting for 16 and 17 year olds was part of the Edinburgh Agreement, which was negotiated by the Liberal Democrats, or delivered by the Liberal Democrats. I think that was her word. Uh, I'm not sure where that leaves the Conservative Party, uh, who were her coalition partners up until a few weeks ago, but perhaps that's still too sore a subject to talk about. Um, of course, the, the, the principal author of the Edinburgh Agreement was that much respected former Secretary of State Michael Moore, um, who a, a very fine individual, and I'm sure there are a few Liberal Democrats wishing that he had perhaps remained the Secretary of State for Scotland, given the current embarrassment of the most recent Secretary of State for Scotland. But nonetheless, we welcome the cooperation with the UK Government that enabled us to uh, uh, undertake the exercise of extending the franchise in 2014 for the referendum and what that has created uh, as a platform for the longer term uh, application of this provision. And I do think there is a substantial point which is advanced by a number of colleagues across the political spectrum in the course of the debate today about the fact that 16 and 17 year olds have been able to participate in the Scottish referendum. They will be able to participate in Scottish parliamentary and local authority elections, but they have been excluded from participation in the Westminster election, and it appears, as currently proposed, that they will be excluded from participating in the EU referendum in, in one moment. And I think that is a point that was made very strongly to me by the group of young Scots that I met with the Young Scot organisation today, some of whom had actually voted in the referendum last September, but were unable to vote a few weeks ago in the Westminster election. And I do think this is an inconsistency that it would be best to resolve. And of course, my colleagues in Westminster will try to advance that argument, and I hope we can make progress. I'll give way to Mr Kelvin. Um, uh, Cabinet Mr. Secretary Kelby. would be interested to know that they're advancing that argument as we speak. The uh, UK Government has just announced uh, and published the bill on the EU referendum, which excludes 16 and 17 year olds and also new year, new EU, EU, EU nationals. Um, would the Cabinet Secretary with me impress on our colleagues on the Conservative benches here to take that opportunity to push for that amendment on that bill? Well, I do, that, that, that was the, the, the sense in which I was making my remark uh, a second ago, and I do hope and genuinely, and I, I, I do applaud the Conservative Party in Scotland for coming to the view they've come to on this issue, and I do hope it's one that can be advanced. And, um, and, and perhaps, perhaps Mr Johnson has a direct line he's about to tell me about. Alex Johnson. I'm afraid I have no direct line. However, uh, would the Cabinet Secretary agree that there is a certain symmetry in the fact that we today are taking the opportunity to decide who will vote in the elections that elect this chamber next year. And it is a certain symmetry to the fact that the House of Commons will decide who will vote 
in their referendum or their future elections. I, 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 I accept the symmetry of the argument, but I think the arguments that have got Mr Johnson and Ms Goldie to the conclusion that they've got today of the welcome participation of 16 17 year olds are just as compelling arguments in relation to the UK general election or the EU referendum. But I'll leave them to advance that argument, as, as others will do. Linda Fabiani made, I think, a really substantial point about the fact that the participation of individuals in the referendum essentially established in their minds the norm of participating in uh, the democratic process. And I'm struck by some of the research that I've seen, which suggests almost that the referendum was such a compelling debate for citizens in Scotland that it activated and reconnected many citizens with the democratic process who had previously been alienated from the democratic process. And I think the fact that the turnout in Scotland was 85%, which um, represents a higher turnout than for any election in which I've certainly been a participant, is, an, is perhaps a validation of that point that the referendum reconnected individuals to the democratic process. And I think that uh, was, was very welcome. Now, on the question, uh, there's two questions I'd like to address specifically, presiding officer. One is on the whole issue of education. And I do take, sympathise entirely with Mr Gibson's points about this. I think the, the argument, I think there was a, a timidity within some aspects of the local authority sector and it, within education that by enabling this debate somehow they were taking sides in the debate. And I think, I, you know, I, I think having the debate, enabling the debate to happen, as long as it's balanced, is something to which nobody should take any exception. And I take from the debate today, and I think Ms Goldie's explanation of the SPICE research, of the variability of decision-making around the country, rather makes that point. So I'll reflect further on that point in terms of the guidance that we believe that should be appropriate, because I don't think we should be timid on this question as long as debate is, is balanced and uh, objective. And the second point are the substantial issues that Jackie Bailey raised about uh, data protection and child protection. And the reason why we're in a different situation from the referendum register is that in the referendum register, we didn't know this was going to be a, a recurring register. And what we have to be satisfied is that in the gathering of information on 14 and 15 year olds who will be the um, attainers in the register, that there is absolute security within the electoral registration office on the handling of that information and its sharing with nobody uh, out with the electoral registration process. There will, however, be a moment when it comes to the sharing of the register for electoral purposes that for um, Individuals who are 15 years and 46 weeks upwards, they will be, their names will be disclosed. And I think we, we have to be absolutely mindful, and I'll look again at all of these provisions, given the issues that have been raised today, to be certain that we are taking the right steps in that respect. But I do believe there has been extensive, extensive consultation with representatives of the child protection organisations and with electoral registration officers to make sure that these issues are properly addressed. But I don't in any way dispute the significance of them, and I will look afresh at these questions before stage two to ensure that the legitimate points that have been raised by Jackie Bailey and others are properly addressed in advance of stage two of the Bill's consideration. Presiding officer, uh, the comment has been made during this debate about the election of uh, Mary Black as the MP for Paisley and uh, Renfrewshire South. A 20-year-old young woman who's um, made already a, a very strong and profound and distinctive contribution to uh, our, our politics. And I think it's indi indicative of the contribution young people can make to the process. And we saw that evidenced by the enthusiasm of young people to participate in the referendum. And I also saw some of that for myself in my discussion with young people along with the Young Scott organisation this morning where young people came from all parts of the country to uh, question me about the issues around this bill, but to express their enthusiasm to be full, active participants in the decision-making of our country. We should be, feel very, very privileged that we have young people with such aspirations to participate in our democracy and will take an important step in facilitating that today by passing the bill that's before Parliament this afternoon. Yeah.
Thank you, Mr Swinney. That concludes the debate on Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 13146, in the name of John Swinney, on the financial resolution for the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill. Can I call on John Swinney to move the motion? Uh, move, President. Thank officer. you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of a parliamentary bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13267 on approval of an SSI. Any member who wants to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now and can ask Mr Fitzpatrick to move. Formally moved. Alice McInnes has indicated that she wishes to speak against the motion. I call Alice McInnes. Ms McInnes, you have up to three minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We do not support this SSI before us this afternoon. When the legislation was first debated in this Parliament, Scottish Liberal Democrats raised our very serious concerns over Part 2 and the powers that it confers. Section 10 allows ministers to make any provision which would improve the exercise of public functions. This includes modifying, conferring, abolishing, transferring or delegating any function. It also includes abolishing or creating or amending the constitution of public bodies. Part 2 allows potentially radical changes to a number of bodies to be made without any ability for Parliament to amend, instead bringing changes to Parliament by statutory instrument. And as Jeremy Purvis said at the time, the Parliament will have a final say, but it will not have a full say in potentially large-scale changes. Now, I know that the Cabinet Secretary uh, assured the Finance Committee that he thought that the had been used in a relatively small number of orders and uh, had been used to make important but small-scale changes. And he thought that that should provide reassurance that the power should be extended for another five years. I don't agree with that. I don't doubt the Minister's good intentions, but I would point out that scale is in the eye of the beholder. We do remain opposed to the powers as set out at Part 2. They are too wide. The legislation was used to bring forward an SSI to abolish prison visiting committees. That, to my mind and to very many prisoners and organisations, was not a small-scale change. Visiting panels played an important role in the lives of people serving prison sentences and their family. And it was a change that should have been subject to thorough, proper parliamentary scrutiny, not the use of an SSI. Today's SSI is not simply about how the powers have been used to date, though. It is about how they could still be used. We are right to work to ensure that this Parliament has all of the scrutiny and amending powers that it requires. And a continuation of the order-making powers undermines our powers here in Parliament. And for that reason, Scottish Liberal Democrats will not support the SSI. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms McInnes. Can I call John Swinney to respond, Deputy First Minister, up to three minutes? Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, Alison McKinnis said that she did not doubt my intentions in bringing forward this order to extend provision that Parliament put into primary legislation back in 2010. Well, back in 2010, these were the words of her former colleague Robert Brown, um, who I think was doubting my intentions. John Swinney seems to want the royal dispensing power that was claimed by the Stuart Kings, which led to their removal in 1649 and again in 1688. I wonder whether he, like Charles I and James VII, regards Parliament as an administrative inconvenience. I now wish to list to Parliament the instances on which these powers have been used. Declassification of the General Teaching Council for Scotland as a public body and turned into an independent profession-led organisation. Hardly the royal dispensing power of the Stuart Kings. Transferred the functions of the Public Standards Commissioner for Scotland and the Public Appointments Commissioner for Scotland to a new Commissioner of Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland at the request not of Ministers, Presiding Officer, but of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. Hardly the Royal Dispensing Powers. Created the roles of prison monitoring coordinators and independent prison monitors and transferred the roles and the functions of prison visiting committees to which Alison McInnes has referred. Provided the basis for measures to provide a greater level of confidence in the working relationship between landlords and tenant farmers. Enabled ministers to recover the costs of Education Scotland, carrying out inspection of independent further education colleges and English language schools. It helped to streamline the, and simplify the planning system in two specific areas and it allowed NHS National Health Services Scotland to provide shared services across the public sector with a view to improving efficiency and productivity. 
We took these powers to try to enable us to undertake modest public service reform without resorting to primary legislation. We gave that commitment in 2010. The eight occasions on which we have used these powers, I think, are evidence that we have used those powers judiciously and wisely, and we seek Parliament's consent to extend that for five more years. Uh, I wish to assure Parliament I have no aspirations to exercise the royal dispensing powers, only to exercise due administrative efficiency over the public sector in Scotland. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 13285, in the name of Don Swinney, on the Scottish elections reduction of voting age bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Scottish elections reduction of voting age bill is agreed to. The next question is that motion number 13146 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Scottish elections reduction of voting age will be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 13267 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 13267 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is as follows. Yes, 99. No, 2. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.